Oprah Winfrey. Who would have guessed that this woman, famous for handing out cars on her talk show, is being cancelled by the entire world? And why, you may ask? Well, Oprah made a career-ending mistake when herself and Dwayne Johnson broke the one rule of being a billionaire. Don't ask poor people for their money. A few weeks ago, Oprah and The Rock announced that they would be starting a relief fund for the victims of the Maui wildfires. The People's Fund of Maui was given a solid $10 million to get off the ground. $10 million donated by Oprah and Dwayne combined. So why is it just Oprah that's getting so much hate? Well, it's because she has a net worth of roughly uh, $2.8 billion. That is billion, with a B. The world is collectively furious at Oprah for having the audacity to ask working class citizens for charity when most people can barely afford to put food on their tables. The Rock and Oprah donated $5 million each to give the fund a head start. Well, guess what? $5 million to Oprah is like 500 to us. Just chump change. Oprah has responded to the backlash online and is very confused as to where all this hate is coming from. Oprah has been known for a long time as being a pretty charitable woman who could forget Oprah's famous, you get a car, you get a car, everyone gets a car moment. The moment was historical on her series and it was parodied time and time again, and it still does to this day. Day. However, what a lot of people don't know is that that wasn't really the case. It wasn't as simple as here are your keys, have fun. Whenever someone gives out anything, especially on television, there's always a catch. For Oprah's audience, the catch was that if they actually wanted to drive away in their brand new car, they would have to pay over $7,000 first in taxes. While Oprah's studio would of course cover like the sales tax and the registration for each car, the audience members were given a choice to either pay the $7,000 and take the car or simply take the cash instead. The infamous moment on the show featured 11 real teachers who were, according to Oprah, in desperate need of a new car. They along with the audience received keys in a box on camera that Oprah claimed to be for their new cars. Everything has a catch though, even now. For someone who's known for being charitable and generous, the word free clearly means something else to Oprah. Now, the world is understandably frustrated. Imagine someone with a physical gold bar around their neck asking you for spare change on the street. Um, hey, what's that thing around your neck? It's shiny, it makes me feel bad about myself. Use that. Oprah has always been a little bit twisted. Let's not forget just what her show really is. Oprah used to bring the most vulnerable people that she could find onto the show to share their stories. While some were just actors, gurus, or people sharing positive tragedies, there were also just so many people who would just cry on her show. And let's not forget the other careers that this woman is responsible for creating, especially programs with some of her friends. Oprah is not just responsible for many hopes and dreams being squashed live on air, she's actually also the creator of a couple of talk show celebrities, namely health expert Dr. Oz, and of course the so-called life coach, Dr. Phil. Before Dr. Phil had his own show, Oprah actually asked him and his courtroom consulting firm to help with a trial. Before meeting Oprah, Phil apparently had zero interest in being a television personality, but eh, Oprah made him see the light, so to speak. According to Phil, she helped him understand the power of these shows and what they were truly made for. For Phil, he brings people onto his show who are struggling with personal issues that just so happen to be good for TV. Remember the Catch Me Outside girl? Dr. Phil made her rich and famous. Good job, buddy. But it's not just Phil that's had some controversial moments. Her other protege, Dr. Oz, has had some pretty rough moments as well. His show is centered around medicine and health, which is never controversial, right? Bringing so-called experts on every week. My mother absolutely loved this guy and she will not stop hammering in his tactics. Oprah was partnered with both of these people, meaning that whatever their shows made, she got a little bit of something for her trouble. Now, she doesn't like to advertise how much she actually made from these programs, but considering how many episodes there have been and how long the programs have run for, it's probably a lot. Like, think about all of the money that this woman has made off of the tragedies of others. This situation with Maui is just another one of the many so-called foundations and charities that she's behind. Now, while some have been extremely beneficial to the world, especially the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for Girls in South Africa, others are just clear cash grabs and bragging right makers like this one. If Oprah really wanted to make a difference and truly help the people of Maui, she would have donated $10 million by herself and gotten Dwayne to match it or something. But let's not forget about the other person involved in the situation, Dwayne Johnson, aka The Rock. 
He's one of the busiest and most bankable men in Hollywood. This man has appeared in everything and he even turned himself into a superhero when he played Black Adam. His power and influence knows no bounds. Now, of these two, we understand why Dwayne would feel that this is an important cause, because he has family on the island and spent a ton of time in Maui growing up. Now, Oprah is just Oprah. She actually purchased a property in Maui not long before the fires broke out. Many believe that the only reason that she even cares about the situation is because she owns land there. If she was still living in the States, she would have continued to live her life without a care in the world. The proof that they believe Maui is home is comparing their efforts to that of Dolly Parton, who organized a foundation to assist people in Tennessee after a wildfire destroyed thousands of homes. I've actually stayed in Gatlinburg, where she's from, many times. It is a beautiful town, but from what I understand, the resort that I used to stay at with my family has practically been burned down to the ground. Dolly did an incredible job and continues to do humanitarian work across the US and around the world to this day. However, when Oprah asked people to do it, it just felt weird. Like someone who was not from this place was taking a vested interest in the situation. Before this Maui situation though, Oprah was a well-respected TV host. But as it turns out, there might have been some dark truths behind the production of her show that should have been red flag after red flag. Case in point, the confidentiality agreements. Now, confidentiality agreements are not uncommon in the world of Hollywood. Heck, Marvel will literally have someone take you out if you even think about sharing their secrets. In Kitty Kelly's tell-all book about Oprah, the author mentions the confidentiality agreements that co-workers and guest stars were made to sign. This included everyone from Tom Cruise to the person who made his muffins. Over 500 staff members were forced to sign this document, but one former employee, Elizabeth Cody, tried to write a book about her time working for Oprah, but she was apparently stopped by the courts, still being tied to this agreement that she had signed, even though she didn't really work for the show anymore. The NDAs were not meant to be a way to keep just the show secrets safe, but any and all of Oprah's secrets as well. According to Elizabeth, the document was signed by almost everyone in Oprah's life. She may have this brand of sweetness and kindness, but apparently that's just not how she is. Elizabeth felt that she was in Oprah's pocket, so to speak, after she signed the paperwork. In 2010, a lawsuit was filed against Oprah and her company. Unicus Performance Training claimed that they were fired for violating the terms of her agreement, specifically involving advertisement with her name or the website of the show. But it's not only the former staff that are made to keep silent. Oprah's own family has spoken out about her past behavior since the news of this scandal broke a few weeks ago. On air, Oprah is portrayed as this wholesome, sweet lady, but according to her stepmother, there is an unknown sign to Oprah hidden from fans for years. According to Barbara, Oprah is one of the most controlling people you will ever meet. She claims that Oprah would not allow them to stay at her house when they tried to visit, forcing her own parents to stay in hotels with money out of their pockets. Barbara also said that Oprah was quick to anger, especially when it came to her staff, with several people being fired left and right over the years for the littlest things. But that's not all. Despite being a billionaire, Barbara actually lets Oprah stay at her home when she visits, which is something that Oprah apparently just hates. The first time she ever stayed over, Oprah allegedly complained that her bed sheets were not a thousand threads and that her bath towels weren't big enough. That last one's a little excusable, okay? If you ever used a giant bath towel, I'm never going back. This woman has billions of dollars to do literally anything she wants and what she wants is to make her family feel like a burden. It turns out that her wild child behavior though started a long time ago, well before she was a TV host, way back when she was just a little one. Several books have been published about Oprah over the years, some from her and some that are not. In her own book that she wrote, Oprah revealed that growing up she was far from an easy kid to handle. When she was young, she was sent to live with her father Vernon after she was caught stealing from her mother's purse. Despite being an on-screen persona known for charity and kindness, she was actually a menace throughout most of her life, according to family members at least. As I've mentioned previously, Oprah's stepmother is not allowed to stay at her house and she is known to be pretty controlling. She admitted to doing some pretty troubling things at a very young age, including staging an amnesia bout where she broke several things in her mother's house and then called the police. According to Oprah's mother, she was uncontrollable, ungrateful, and after robbing her, maybe a little bit crazy. As the situation continues, more and more is surely going to come out of the situation with Oprah. While the current news is that 
the fund is active, she is inactive and refuses to discuss the backlash with anyone. She recently made a television appearance giving one of her most honest interviews of all time, discussing things like her use of Ozempic, obesity in general, and the shame that surrounds weight loss supplements. That's nice, but where's the money talk? People loved Oprah up until a few weeks ago, and now she won't even comment on the hate that she's receiving. Number 10, she knew already. While all of the controversy surrounding Russell has come to light this year, it seems that Katy Perry may have known exactly who Russell was very early on in their relationship. An interview with Vogue magazine from 2013 has been making rounds online. During the interview, Katy reflects on her brief marriage to Russell, claiming that she felt responsible for the dissolution of their union until she found out the real truth. When they first met, Russell wanted to find an equal, but once he got that equal, he could no longer handle the, the equalness. She went on to say that he became very controlling as time went on, and while at first she felt responsible for the split, she discovered the truth eventually. The truth was something that she quote, can't necessarily disclose because she keeps it locked in a safe for a rainy day. It sounds like Katie not only knew of the misconduct back in 2013, but she actively kept that information to herself. Had she just come forward, this entire situation could have been addressed a long time ago, but the victims were only willing to share their experiences after being hounded by reporters. Whether she planned on revealing the information at a later date or not, she denied the people that Russell hurt a chance to speak up as soon as possible. Number 9. Tried to have a baby Katie admitted that while she was married to Russell Brand, that the topic of starting a family was a regular conversation. For Katie, it was pretty simple. She did not want to start a family with someone who she was pretty confident would use that family as an excuse to control her, but Russell is, you know, a, a wholesome family man who is just ready to settle down, right? Katie admitted during an interview with Marie Claire that she was scared of Russell trying to make her a stay-at-home mom. When these two were a couple, Russell had some popularity in films and TV, but Katy Perry was, well, Katy Perry. She kissed a girl and she liked it. She was hot and cold and she blew up like a firework. Make him go, ah, ah. I'm sorry, I gotta get that out of my system. I just got a little carried away sometimes. As the relationship went on, the conversation stayed the same. Not ready till she knows he's gonna be a good dad and let her do her thing. Well, that was certainly not the case, and Katie believes that her unwillingness to bear a child is one of the main causes of Russell's decision. Whether that's true or not, Katie clearly made the smartest decision of her life when she said no to this man. Clearly a word that he was used to hearing, but heh, he's known to ignore it. Oh, that guy sucks. Number 8. She was almost a victim The allegations being brought against Russell claim that he is known for being aggressive, handsy, and just an overall nightmare of a human being. It's not even close to the right word, but it's the only one I can use. The general consensus is that this man is not good at first impressions. Most of the accounts being brought forward claim Russell to have been a tyrant since the moment they've met, with each allegation worse than the last. Katie's first interaction with Brand was filming a scene for the 2009 comedy Get Him to the Greek, a spin-off of Forgetting Sarah Marshall featuring his character Aldous Snow, the musician, and Jonah Hill as like a record label employee. Katie made a cameo appearance in a scene that was ultimately cut from the final project, and the scene saw Katie and Russell's characters just locking lips during the opening montage of his downfall. Katie told Glamour back in 2010 that at the time she was stoked to film the scene, but it was their second meeting that really should have been Katie's first warning sign. They rediscovered each other when Russell took the stage at the MTV Video Music Awards in 2009. Katie flung a bottle at him and he he caught it, but after the show, he was furious. When Katy Perry approached him, he claimed that she was fiery and that she caught his attention. Katy went on to describe the interaction and what Russell attempted to do that very same night. Katy admitted that Russell attempted to force himself on her, but she was successfully able to steer clear of him. Russell was furious, but he listened to what she said and he apparently walked away. Four months later, they were engaged. Katy may not have understood what was happening at the time, but considering the horror stories coming out about Russell, she may have saved herself from becoming just another one of his victims. Number 7. The text Breaking up with someone over text is a stupid thing to do. That is one thing that many of us learn as we grow up. Face to face needs to happen when it's something serious like a breakup or personal issues. While most people learn that by the time they're in their you know mid-twenties, Russell is in his forties and still doesn't seem to get the memo. Katie released a documentary concert called Katy Perry Part of Me, containing a clip that really should have stalled Russell's career the moment that it came to air, but oh well. 
well. The clip shows Katie lying down in a makeup chair, sobbing, being told that she can either call it quits or continue the show. She had just received a text from Russell, essentially asking her for a divorce. After a moment, she stands and she's good to go, but during an interview in 2013 with Vogue, Katie told the outlet that she could not divulge the specific message that was sent. But to put it into perspective, she had not heard from him for two years following the cryptic text. We have to wonder what words he used and why he decided that a text was the best way to deliver this news. It literally makes l no sense at all. Just none at all. Russell sucks. Number six, marriage went cold quick. Marriages do not have an exact timeline. Some last for 50 years, some for 50 days. For Katie and Russell, their marriage was cut short after only 14 months together. As previously mentioned, Russell was really the one who decided to call it quits, basically out of the blue. In the years since the divorce, Katie just maintains that Russell was slowly losing interest in her as a partner. According to Katie, Russell was jealous of her fame and would even attempt to berate her into thinking that he was the superior one in the relationship. When he decided to call it quits, she blamed herself at first but soon discovered a secret truth about Russell that she keeps in her back pocket. The brief marriage is already a red flag in and of itself, but the timeline is just all over the place. Russell is known to be a chaotic man in general, sharing some pretty ridiculous views on politics, religion, everything. But during his time with Katie, that attitude never went away. According to her, he was constantly cornering her to spout his views, and he just would not let her go until she just kind of nodded and agreed. Now, it's not just Katie who has noticed Russell being an absolutely dreadful person. So for the rest of this list, let's talk about some general red flags that we've noticed over the years. Number five, Aldous Snow. Aldous Snow is a character that Russell played first in the film Forgetting Sarah Marshall and then reprising the role in a spin-off called Get Him to the Greek alongside Jonah Hill. The worst thing about this character is just how easy it is for Russell to get into him. While doing press for the Greek, Russell was compared to his on-screen counterpart all of the time. This dude was always on no-no juice, partying hard, he was just basically Russell but on screen. But he would constantly deny any relations. In fact, during an interview with MTV, he told Laramie Legal that he was much more cool and mellow and slower and not as silly as some of you may think. We all know that's not true. Jonah Hill has gone on record saying that filming with Russell was super difficult. While they were both dedicated to the craft, Jonah just took the project a bit more seriously than Russell did. All the Snow was set to be a regular character on the big screen, but following the release of his film Arthur, Russell's acting career as a leading man was basically just gone. Number four, he was banned by the king. The comedian turned actor may be best known for All the Snow, but for All the Snow, or maybe his musical chops with the real fake band Infant Sorrow, but what many may not know is just how much this dude hates the royal family. Ah, who am I kidding? It's obvious, just look at him. He took to YouTube to express his opinions and declared that it was ridiculous to have a queen and having to be forced to call her things like your majesty. What's with Russell? He's just, he's such a jerk. He dug his hole even deeper when in his book Revelation, he criticized the queen for her German heritage, calling her a word that I'm not allowed to say online and don't Google it. Needless to say, this was a perfectly logical reason to ban Bran from entering the palace gates ever again in his life. He's actually one of the few celebrities in the entire world to receive this honor, so it really should have been the first big red flag when it came to this guy. Number three, his rants. If there is one thing that Russell is well known for, it's his political and religious rants, which are usually pushed on people with, you know, without their knowledge or permission. By that I mean you probably already paid good money to see this man live expecting a comedic performance, but you were instead met with some pretty messed up ideas about religion and just kind of the world in general. During one special on Netflix, Russell compared himself to Jesus a few times and gave several long-winded examples that I don't really want to repeat because, you know. This man has some truly dark beliefs. If you're curious what they are, just wait a year or two for the crime documentary to come out. Russell Brand, a special brand of evil. Man, that's a good title. I am smart. Number two, stand up. His rants are not just limited to the paying stage. This man is known around the world as a fairly mid-comedian. Now, nowadays he's probably known as the creepy guy from bedtime stories, but if you've had the misfortune of popping into an open mic or maybe even onto the streets of England, there's a good chance that you've been forced to listen to Russell Brand's stand-up. His comedy is crude, he veers into rants and statements more often than telling jokes, and at the end of the day, people feel like they just witnessed an underwhelming TED talk about Lord knows what. Now, I've I've personally only seen like one or two of this dude's stand-up specials and I can say with confidence, he is not okay. He's really not. 
Number one, and at number one, Channel 4, BBC. BBC Channel 4 News has been a staple in the world of British television for years, and by staple, I mean it's responsible for some of the worst celebrity interviews you've ever watched, but we've talked about that in a different list. Channel 4 is on this list because they have all of the secrets just wrapped up into a little bow. Not only did the outlet literally help launch this dude's career, but they have recently been at the forefront of the media storm thanks to a little documentary centered around Russell that clearly outs him as a vile and disgusting man. He has treated so many people so terribly over the years with justice finally being served and the proof clearly being in the pudding. At number 10, Russell Brand. This man has been slowly exposing himself to the public over the years as his chaotic energy has just gotten worse and worse. Brand has previously gone down in history as being the worst host of the Video Music Awards ever, but now he's going down in history for being an absolutely terrible human being. Four women have come forward alleging that Brand mistreated them verbally and physically between the years of 2006 and 2014, arguably the height of his career. He strongly denies the allegations and in a video that he posted himself, the actor claimed that while he was promiscuous, all relationships were consensual. One woman claimed that Russell had started a relationship with her in 2006 while she was still in high school and he was 30. Apparently they met when Brand bumped into her at the mall. According to the woman, the relationship was meant to be anonymous, with Russell asking her to straight up lie to her parents. He even wrote her a script to keep things smooth. Another woman alleged similar behavior in 2007, but added that he had a massive temper, because Coming physical with her a few times. Several more women have spoken about their situations with Brand, all of which were eerily similar and showed that he is a pattern of mistreatment. At number 9, Jonah Hill. Unfortunately, it would appear that the once funny man turned Oscar nominee is really a jerk. Recently, a news article broke of his ex-girlfriend, Sarah Bradley, revealing evidence that Hill was emotionally damaging towards her during their relationship. The couple first got together in 2021, meeting on the beach as she was a surf instructor. According to a series of texts, between Sarah and Jonah, it's obvious that he is manipulative. He told Sarah to remove any photos of her in a bathing suit, which was a lot of them due to her being a surf instructor. When she did that, he told her it was a good start, but she didn't seem to get his point. He then told her, it's not my place to teach you. I've made my boundaries clear. You refuse to let go of some of them, and you've made that clear, and I hope it makes you happy. People felt that his boundaries were closer to ridiculous demands, and in another screenshot, Hill explained his conditions for maintaining their relationship, including stating that he didn't want Sarah surfing with men, aka her job. He wrote a massive list of boundaries and rules that were just clearly him trying to control everything Sarah did. At number 8, Oprah Winfrey. Who would have guessed that the woman once famous for handing out cars on her talk show is being cancelled by the world? Why? Well, Oprah made a career-ending mistake when herself and Dwayne Johnson broke the one rule of being a billionaire, don't ask poor people for money. Last week, Winfrey and The Rock announced that they would be starting a relief fund for the victims of Maui wildfires. The People's Fund of Maui was given a solid $10 million to get off the ground, $10 million donated by Winfrey and Johnson combined. So why is it just Oprah getting so much hate online? Well, it's because she has a net worth of roughly $2.8 billion, billion with a B. The internet is collectively furious at Oprah for having the audacity to ask working class citizens for charity when most people can barely afford to put food on their their table. The Rock and Oprah donated $5 million each to give the fund a head start, except $5 million to Oprah is like $500 to us. Oprah ended up addressing all the hate online, telling the Daily Mail that she was disappointed in the reaction from the world. Rather than focus on the good things and the people of Maui, the world was mad that she asked them to give a nickel. Oprah has yet to confirm if she will be donating any more to the fund, but so far it's not looking very promising. At number 7, Drew Barrymore. The actress and now talk show host made headlines last week when she announced when her very popular popular show, The Drew Barrymore Show, would return to air despite there being a massive writer strike in Hollywood at the moment that a majority of celebs have shown their support towards. The Charlie's Angel star claimed that the move was not intended to make light of the current situation, but rather as a way to create a safe environment to discuss the difficult topics. She posted a video to Instagram apologizing for all the pain the decision had clearly caused people. The writers who worked on her show before the strike were literally standing outside of CBS studios with picket signs. The internet called her a number of different insults and asked that she be fired from the show altogether. Well, apparently Drew heard everyone's cries and decided to keep the show off air for now. While she made the right move in the end, it may be too little too late.
At number 6, Danny Masterson. The actor, best known for his role on the sitcom That 70s Show, has been convicted on serious charges of misconduct. Three women came forward detailing a time when Masterson aggressively took advantage of them. Three separate incidents took place between 2001 and 2003, but a verdict was not reached until just this year. The first round of investigations actually took place while he was still on That 70s Show, but at the time there wasn't enough physical evidence to take things very far. In 2017, the investigation was reopened and it was reported that he once again being investigated. The women spoke about Masterson's misdeeds and they were eventually able to scrape together enough evidence for a conviction. Another woman came forward in 2017, rounding it up to four accusers. It was revealed throughout the proceedings that Netflix had actually tried to dispute the claims of these women as a way to maintain their working relationship with Masterson. Eventually, he was fired from the ranch and, well, everything with his name attached to it. The actor defended himself tooth and nail right up until the final verdict. In the last year, former co-stars like Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis wrote character statements supporting Danny and literally claiming that he was a role model. At number 5, Jada Pinkett Smith. Jada was well known for a long time, mostly as Will Smith's wife, but also for her occasional acting roles. These days, she's known as a disgruntled talk show host. For a few years, Pinkett Smith hosted a talk show online called Red Table Talk, where she would invite guests to come on so they could discuss various topics, from upcoming projects to the man she was dating while her and Will were on Not So Good Terms. The show was known for getting a little too deep into Jada's personal life, often making the viewers and her guests very uncomfortable, revealing details that nobody asked for. The company she worked for eventually decided to shut down their streaming and her show would suffer. The show may have also been cancelled due in part to her husband smacking Chris Rock in the face. At number 4, Colleen Ballinger. Former YouTuber and current demon, Colleen Ballinger has recently been outed as having inappropriate relationships with her young fans. Luckily, nothing went as far as becoming physical, but her involvement in various group chats with fans half her age was extremely inappropriate. Ballinger was best known for her character Miranda Sings, who became so popular on YouTube that she received her own Netflix series. If you haven't seen that, too late, it's been removed now. She was basically messaging her fans to deliver so-called advice when she was really just trying to manipulate them into being her unpaid employees and sending them to bat for her during any kind of drama. Following the backlash, Colleen decided to post an apology online. The only thing was, she did it while playing a ukulele. In response to the cringiest apology of all time, her former fans decided to cancel her for good by reminding the world of a number of inappropriate bits, sketches, and jokes she probably shouldn't have done and certainly should not have been available to children to watch. At number 3, Katy Perry. Recently, Katy Perry took to social media to announce that she wants to quit being a judge on American Idol after six years over a fear that she's being made to look like a bad guy by the producers. For those who don't know, Perry had an interesting reaction to a contestant revealing she was a mother of three and being much older than she looked. In response, Perry stood up out of her chair and almost laid on the judge's table. The contestant, Sarah Beth, then sarcastically said that if Katy laid on the table, she would die, and Katy responded with, honey, you've been laying on the table too much in reference to her having multiple kids at a young age. At first, everyone laughed and this all seemed in good fun, but following her audition, Sarah announced she would be going back to California to be with her family, claiming she just wasn't cut out for show business. She later took to TikTok to call Perry out for the joke, which was shaming her in a number of different ways. Katie has been defending herself since the video, claiming it was not meant to be harmful, but she's made similar comments and jokes to many contestants over the years. At number two, Justin Roiland. The creator of the adult cartoon comedy series Rick and Morty was on a hot streak at the start of 2023. Rick and Morty had been just renewed for another season. His first person adventure comedy High on Life was becoming one of the most played games across the country and oh then he got arrested for being a jerk. Turns out that this man who made the world laugh was also a man who made women cry. It was revealed that he would be facing two separate criminal charges in Orange County stemming from a domestic incident that took place in 2020 with the woman he was dating at the time. While he denied the allegations at first, several Several other women came forward to share their stories of mistreatment from Justin, who had apparently been sending them horrific DMs online that varied from pretty tame to the creepiest stuff you've ever heard. Roiland was stripped of his contract with Disney and Hulu, who'd been distributing his series on its streaming services and were funding his most 
most recent projects. Roiland was also replaced on both Solar Opposites and Rick and Morty, with the current news being Dan Stevens is taking his place. And at number one, Donald Trump. In 2006, Donald Trump was known as a wealthy real estate mogul with a hit reality series called The Apprentice. He was recently married to Melania with a four month old baby. However, reports leaked that Trump was actually in the midst of an affair with adult film star Stormy Daniels after she filed a civil suit claiming the contract he made her sign to keep quiet was invalid. Daniels claimed that herself and Trump shared an intimate relationship for roughly a year during his marriage to Melania. These aren't the first allegations of an affair as Trump has been back and forth in the media since the 70s, being accused by 26 women of mistreatment or misconduct. While these rumors have never held any merit at first, the truth was finally set free. After being the most chaotic president in recent history, it was announced in March that Trump was arrested on 34 separate violations of a New York law against falsifying business documents to conceal another crime. Over the years, he was essentially taking company money and using it to pay off anyone who may have been a threat to him, both personally and politically. Number 10. Demi Lovato. Demi Lovato was once a young actress working on the Disney Channel, being on the show Sunny with a Chance and featuring in the film Camp Rock alongside Joe Jonas. Following her time on Sunny with a Chance and the Camp Rock series, Demi shifted her focus towards her music career, but things quickly started going downhill. While on camera, she seemed sweet and innocent, but behind the scenes, she was becoming deeply engulfed in the world of substances and violence. Unfortunately, she suffered several breakdowns over the years, having to be hospitalized several times culminating in an overdose a few years back. And despite almost passing away, she continued her partying lifestyle, and so far as we know, she still does to this day. Number nine, Ben Affleck. These days, Ben is known for being himself in movies and playing the role to a T, something that he was also known for at the beginning of his career. But there was a brief moment in between A and B when Ben was not doing okay. The Goodwill Hunting star was a good guy in the eyes of the media. He loved his brother, he loved Matt Damon, but it turns out that behind the scenes, he also loved No No Juice. It was after his time on the set of Goodwill Hunting that he decided to take hold of his issues. Initially, he just wanted to quit altogether, but in 2001, he attended a rehabilitation program. This was when it was revealed that Ben had a hidden problem. He spent years going in and out of rehab. However, he has received nothing but support from his fans and the Hollywood community. These days, you can catch him on the big screen or snuggling up to his rekindled flame, Jennifer Lopez. Number eight, Ellen DeGeneres. Ellen had one of the most viewed talk shows of all time until she was canceled earlier this year. Despite appearing to be a bright and cheery host on screen, behind the scenes, she was in charge of an extremely toxic work environment. Eventually, an article was released containing testimonies from several former employees naming Ellen directly as one of the main antagonists. Ellen canceled herself by denying every single thing that she was being accused of, and instead of acknowledging her faults and missteps, she issued a half-hearted apology and was forced to cancel both herself and her show amid the controversy. Number seven, Bradley Cooper. The star of the Hangover trilogy was actually able to pull a lot of his character's life from his own experiences. While Bradley may be well known for his acting chops, he is not known for being too much of a party man. And it turns out it's because he put all of that in the past. Bradley made an appearance on the podcast Smartless, featuring Sean Hayes from Will & Grace, Jason Bateman from Ozark, and Will Arnett from Arrested Development. He got real with the gang as he was actually very close with Will Arnett for many years, claiming he was the one who encouraged and helped him to get sober. According to Bradley, when he first moved to Los Angeles, it felt like being thrown back into high school. Initially moving here for a role in the TV series Elias, he was eventually fired from the show. Being out of work while also dealing with an injury to his Achilles tendon, Bradley fell deep into no-no snow and juice that took over his every waking moment. The turnaround came in 2004 when he was having dinner with Will Arnett, who at the time was well known for mean humor as a stand-up. Will asked how Bradley felt about a dinner that they had a few nights prior with some folks that he had never met before. Believing the night went incredibly well, Will revealed that Bradley was actually incredible rude. He was ignorant and he dropped a few swear words that I'm not allowed to say online. This was the moment that he realized he was not funny, he was just being a jerk. Bradley began attending meetings and writing his wrongs and by the time he was in the Hangover series, he had been sober for years. When the story was first revealed, fans were thrilled to learn of his journey and how much he had overcame. Being someone who was exposed, but eh, it only made us like him more. Number six, Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel is known for a few things, family, action, being paid a million dollars, to say I am Groot over and over again, lots of stuff. But there is one thing that many people did not know about Vin Diesel until the mid 2010s. Something so dark and mysterious that it is going to haunt your dreams. Vin Diesel, 
plays Dungeons and Dragons. Now I know it's not like he has a no-no snow addiction or anything, but come on, that's pretty neat. While promoting his film, The Last Witch Hunter, Vin Diesel appeared on the YouTube channel Geek and Sundry, along with the epic voice actor and host of the D&D series Critical Role, Matthew Mercer. Marketing the episode as D and Diesel, Fast and Furious fans were taken back by the sudden geeky side of Vin. Well, according to his Fast co-star Michelle Rodriguez in 2019, he could not contain his nerdiness on set. Vin even has a bunch of D&D themed tattoos on his body, and he proudly shows them to anyone who asks. Fans were actually really happy to see this side of Vin. If they wanted to keep making episodes of D and Diesel, I don't think anyone would be very upset about that. Number five, Justin Bieber. Justin became a massive success at a very young age. By the time he reached his teens, he had an album on the way, millions of fans, and some pretty wild accusations. Despite being a baby-faced boy with a big smile, it turned out that Justin had secretly been a very angry man behind the scenes. Around the time he was 17, Justin was photographed flipping off the paparazzi, and he even got into a few physical altercations on multiple occasions. He had also developed a bad habit for no-no juice and a few other illicit substances, something he admitted to before he was the legal age to do anything, really. Several people just out and about started to notice his behavior shifting. Justin lacked self-awareness, and apparently he tended to swear while he was on flights or if he was in restaurants, like a lot. Eventually, his whole good guy thing wore thin, and he was becoming a menace. He raced cars, he spit on his fans, and he even vomited on stage. By the time 2018 rolled around, his reputation was completely tarnished. He was eventually able to scrape together his career, he apologized for his actions, and nowadays he's too busy being married to be crazy. Nah, who are we kidding? He's nuts. Number four, Jesse Smollett. In January of 2019, famous actor Jesse Smollett walked into a Chicago police precinct and reported that he had just been the victim of a hate crime. He told the police that two strangers began shouting racial slurs while one was just yelling at him, the other was pouring the chemical bleach onto him before they'd both held him down and tied a rope around him. He claimed to have suffered severe rope burn and was physically ill from the experience. As we all know now, that isn't exactly what happened. The so-called strangers were actually two brothers who worked with Jesse on the set of the hit series Empire. According to inside sources, Jesse paid the brothers $3,500 each to help him stage the event, planning every single detail right down to the precinct visit. The proof that all of this was a ruse made up for publicity was the fact that the altercation conveniently took place directly in front of a security camera, and an investigation took place that found ample evidence that Smollett had set himself up. They found receipts for the ropes used during the altercation left in the assailant's home. Way to hide the evidence, boys. There was also security footage taken from the store where the brothers can be seen trying on and purchasing ski masks, gloves, and red hats, and I would pay anything to see that footage. It would be so fun. At the end of the day, Jesse was forced to serve 150 days in prison and pay the Chicago Police Department over $300,000 for wasting their time and resources. By the way, if before you all get mad about how I'm pronouncing his name, I just want to remind you that he faked a hate crime. So maybe focus on that. Number three, Tiger Woods. Tiger's secret life made headlines in 2009 when the news broke that he wasn't just some pro on the golf course, he was a cheater too. It turns out that the same year his son Charlie was born that he was having several affairs, including a full-on relationship with a woman named Rachel. Before the news broke, he was the most familyest of mans around. Tiger was photographed with his wife Ellen Nordegren on numerous occasions, and the couple could not have been happier. He was a golf pro, slowly making his way to the top. He had a loving wife at home and a growing family. But it wasn't enough. This dude needed to be sneaky and make problems for himself. His secret life was revealed after one of his many lovers leaked a series of texts proving the affair. Several more women came forward, and soon enough, Tiger was running away from Ellen as she chased him with his favorite nine iron. Tiger was forced to reveal his secret to the world, bringing shame on his career as a golfer and just a human being in general. Number two, George Michael. George is of course very open about his orientation these days and is never one to shy away from the topic, but unfortunately coming out was not his decision to make. In 1998, George was caught engaging in a physical activity with an undercover police officer in a public restroom. The only punishment received at the time was a $500 fine and 80 hours of community service. However, it was the public reaction and press coverage that really put the nail into his coffin. The headline, Zip Me Up Before You Go Go, was on the Sun's front 
front page. Following the incident, he was forced to out himself to the world. There had been rumors for years that George was gay, something that he did reveal to his sister and close friends by the time he was 19. But in 2007, he revealed that he decided not to come out to his parents, claiming the emotional toll the knowledge may have on them could be too much. According to George, keeping the truth hidden for so long took a toll on his mental health. When he finally revealed the truth, a massive weight was lifted. It may not have been his choice to reveal himself to the world, but he took it in strides and became the man that he is today. And at number one, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnie was the king of the action scene for over 20 years. He first debuted in 1970 in Hercules in New York, and while his face was on display, his voice was dubbed over by another actor. Thus, the secret life. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's not the secret. It's actually his secret family that landed him on this list. As some may know, Arnold partook in a little affair with one of his housekeepers, Mildred Baina, while still married to his wife, Maria Shriver. Arnie and Maria have four children together, and they were not stoked to find out that they had a secret brother. Arnold was well aware that his son existed. Joseph is the youngest of his children. Born in 1997, well into his film career, Arnold was forced to hide his son and his lover. The last thing he wanted was for the world to surround his son and make growing up a nightmare. In fact, it took Arnold seven years before he realized that Joseph was actually his. Mildred decided to keep the pregnancy a secret and continued to work for Arnold, but eventually it was obvious that Joseph was his. According to Arnold, he just noticed that Joseph was starting to look more and more like himself. And eventually everybody spoke and Arnold knew that Joseph was his. For a few years, he decided it would be safe to conceal the truth and take care of the family under the table. But when Joseph was in the eighth grade, someone close to the family leaked the information regarding both the affair and the existence of the unnamed secret son. Arnold was forced to come out and take the heat for the affair. While Joe and Arnie are close now, it took a long time to get to that place. Of course, his main family was shocked and a little bit upset that their dad had a whole other family that he didn't tell them about, but eh, who cares about them? Number 10, Jeremy Allen White and Addison Timlin. Jeremy made a big move in the acting world after his FX comedy series The Bear premiered on Disney Plus this past year, but he's actually been making people laugh, cry, and scream since starring as Lip Gallagher in the hit TV series Shameless, a show that I definitely haven't watched 10 times start to finish back to back. Definitely wouldn't do that. No, no sir. He met his future wife, Addison, on set of a film called After School in 2008. They were close friends for almost 12 years before becoming an official item in 2019. The relationship has mainly taken place behind the scenes apart from a few Instagram posts, but Jeremy's love for his wife has been well known since his acceptance speech at the 2023 Golden Globes, where he won the award for the best actor in a musical or comedy TV series. Unfortunately, roughly two months ago, Addison filed for a divorce from Jeremy with little to no explanation so far. Three days following the divorce announcement, she posted a picture of herself with her daughter on Instagram and captioned it, single mom, which was apparently news to Jeremy, who was under the impression that they would be co-parenting. While their relationship may have ended in a mess, there might be a new one on the horizon as Jeremy was spotted with Wizards of Waverly Place star Selena Gomez. Hey, Lip Gallagher and Alex Russo would be so cute together. Number nine, Natalie Portman. After 11 years of marriage, it was recently announced that Thor Love and Thunder star Natalie Portman and her husband, Benjamin Millipede, will be separating following a very public and messy affair on Ben's part. Ben, who I assume is named after a kid's cartoon, was spotted with a 25-year-old climate activist. While Portman was mad, she initially did try to work things out with Ben in an attempt to save their marriage, but the affair put a massive strain on their relationship. The couple had met on set of the 2009 drama Black Swan, with Ben acting as a script writer for the project. While the affair had shaken up their relationship, when asked about the issues by Us Weekly, he said that he shared her pain and that he was sending her a new script. I don't know, while they may still be working together professionally, emotionally speaking, they have definitely checked out. Number eight, Drake Bell and Janet Von Schmeling. Drake was a small screen sweetheart in the early 2000s, starring in several Nickelodeon shows and movies like Drake and Josh, The Amanda Bynes Show, and of course the live action Fairly Odd Parents. He was on track to be a mega star in the world of Hollywood, but unfortunately is one of the many Nickelodeon stars who took a turn for the worse. He starred in a number of low budget flicks over the years, but his status as a celebrity 
celebrity was gone at that point. The nail was finally driven into the coffin in 2021 when Drake was sentenced to two years of probation and 200 hours of community service after it was revealed that he had been grooming a younger fan for years. So if you see him in an orange jumpsuit cleaning graffiti off of a wall, you might know why. Recently, it was announced that his wife Janet had filed for divorce from Drake following that situation and another one where he was missing for five days on a bender doing God knows what with the strange women and friends that she had never met. On the actual paperwork, Vaughn has cited irreconcilable differences and has requested legal and physical custody of their younglings. In April of this year, Drake was reported missing only to turn up completely unharmed five days later and according to Janet, Drake's mental health had slowly been declining in the last few years. His toxicity towards his partners is nothing new as his ex Melissa Lingefelt accused him of being verbally manipulative and physically violent. Between his rocky history and declining mental health, we're happy to see that Janet got out of there before anything too crazy took place. Who knows how bad of a dad this guy could actually be. I mean, we all know he can't build a treehouse. Number 7. Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner Joe and Sophie got together back in 2016 after they had been set up by mutual friends, something that they had been trying to do for quite some time. They got together and instantly fell in love, getting married just over a year after getting together. Sophie admitted to Rolling Stones in 2019 that she was hesitant at first. Joe was this big musician and she was a big TV and film star, meaning that most of the time they would be on opposite ends of the world. Eventually she warmed up and got together with Joe officially, but the split came out of nowhere. For the most part, their relationship has seemed to be stable on the outside. They were never a part of a cheating scandal, which is surprising considering Joe's lack of discretion in the past. There were never any strange rumors or photos. They were just this happy couple. But as of September 1st, Joe Jonas has filed for a divorce from Sophie, with the only current information being that Joe has claimed the relationship to be irretrievably broken. Something pretty serious must have gone on in a very short amount of time. Only hours before the announcement, Joe posted a photo of himself to Instagram with his ring on full display. Despite the minimal amount of tea spilt so far, we are in for a very messy divorce. Number 6. Britney Spears and Sam Asghari Britney and Sam's marriage is in shambles. The couple that got together back in 2016 seemed to be great on the outside. As Britney was getting better overall, her relationship with Sam became more and more serious. Sam was right there by her side through thick and thin. Eventually, they tied the knot in 2022, which is why it was so devastating for her fans to learn that the couple had called it quits just a little over a month ago. The words used on the actual divorce paperwork say irreconcilable differences, which for Hollywood people just tends to mean nothing good. Sam was the one to officially file for the divorce, demanding that Britney pay spousal support and attorney fees. Since this news is so recent, there is no current update on how the couple are doing or how deep into the process they are. Britney once again made headlines in the media, something that she hadn't really done since the early 2010s. Her divorce was covered constantly and the internet has been weighing in their decisions ever since. Number 5. Ariana Grande and Ethan Slater So bear with me here for a moment because Ariana is actually the cause of this divorce, so strap in. The pop star and Broadway giant are set to star in a film adaptation of the Broadway hit Wicked following the story of the Wicked Witch before the events of The Wizard of Oz. Ariana plays Glinda the Good and Slater is Bach, the main love interest of the Wicked Witch. It's ironic that Ariana is the good witch though as she appears to have stolen another woman's man. Ethan was married to a woman named Lily J since 2018 and the pair even welcomed their first child into the world in 2022. Apparently, Ariana and Ethan fell in love on set and started dating behind the scenes. However, on set insiders shared the information to Slater's wife, who was furious, and while the couple have agreed to raise their child as co-parents, Ethan officially filed for a divorce in July of this year. Number 4. Billy Porter and Adam Smith Billy and Adam have been together for six years before recently announcing their amicable divorce. The American Horror Story star and his husband, Adam, met after being introduced by a mutual friend in 2009. They briefly dated but ultimately split before getting back together in 2015 and tying the knot a year later. Over the past few years, they have been one of Hollywood's favorite couples, regularly being spotted at award ceremonies and fancy events, just happily holding each other. It's so cute, it makes me want to vomit. Unfortunately, their relationship seems to have slowly fizzled out as they announced they would be filing for a divorce. The decision came from a conversation that they had and a decision that they made mutually, claiming they will remain friends for the rest of their lives. However, the online rumors and backlash suggest that something a little bit darker has taken 
taking place behind the scenes. They've asked everyone to give them some privacy, so why don't we skip some bad jokes and not get into the rumors and just move on to the next entry. Number 3, Shanine Doherty and Kurt Isrienko. This past April, the alumni of Charmed filed for a divorce from her husband Kurt after 11 years of marriage. She was photographed in March without her wedding ring on display, causing many to assume that the divorce had been something planned for quite some time. As with most celebrities who file for divorce, the couple cited irreconcilable differences. Shanine claimed that the divorce was the last thing she wanted. Unfortunately, her hubby left her no options. While there was no real confirmation on what was happening behind the scenes, according to Shanine herself, Kurt's agent was intimately involved with their divorce. Neither Kurt nor his agent has spoken out about the rumors, probably because they're too busy getting down. Ooh. Number 2, Noel Gallagher and Sarah McDonald. The former Oasis frontman, now in his mid-50s, revealed that himself and his wife Sarah would be filing for a divorce after 12 years of marriage. According to Noel, the couple simply got bored with each other, something not uncommon for people in their 50s. Speaking with Ireland's Hot Press magazine, Sarah told the outlet that the split was because she was sick and tired of Noel's partying habits. Even at the age of 55, this guy is acting like he's 20 years old, coming home late and reeking of no-no juice. Noel denied the claims and said that it was because of 2020 and being stuck with her for months on end. Noel claimed that while he hated his time in isolation, it was a very revealing time in his life. He was able to work on songs that were unfinished, as well as create some new ones. Much like a ton of couples at that time, they were realizing that they just weren't good at sharing a space. Before, they were able to go out and about and be alone, but for a solid six months, it was just them in a house every single day. So we get it. Number one, Reese Witherspoon and Jim Toff. Over the years, Reese made quite the name for herself, starring in films like Legally Blonde, Walk the Line, and Hot Pursuit. She was well known for being a comedic actor, able to tap into her serious side when the time came for it. Along for the ride right up until 2023 was Jim Toff. Jim has starred in a handful of projects, but mainly acts as a producer, creating sitcoms like According to Jim. The couple first got together in 2011 and quickly tied the knot. Over the last 12 years, there was never a sign that this couple was headed for disaster, but that may be due in part to them not getting out much. Reese has continued to act fairly steadily over the years, but for some reason, she has been appearing less and less in the public. Perhaps there was something going on behind the scenes as the announcement came only two days before they were supposed to celebrate their 12 year anniversary. According to a statement released by both of them, the decision was a mutual one, saying that they enjoyed their time with each other, but things just don't work out sometimes. Number 10, Cardi B. Cardi is well known for her quick wit and wicked throwing arm, but of course the world loves her for her lyrical talents. Jimmy clearly did not do any research on Cardi or what he could expect having her on as a guest. Cardi was in full, well, Cardi mode when she appeared on Jimmy's show in 2017. Jimmy welcomed her to the show, to which she replied with, Thank you! <laughs> yeah, this left Jimmy speechless. As Cardi begins the interview, Jimmy just has this look of concern on his face. She speaks with a hard Bronx accent and is very animated in her expressions and movements. He clearly asks the questions that are written on his cue card rather than actually engaging with her. And when he does actually attempt to get on her level, which was just him mimicking her reactions, literally saying brrrr is totally right. Jimmy just kind of went along with what she was saying. If you want to laugh, I suggest you watch the entire interview. It would take me a full like 20 minutes just to go through the highlights. Number 9, Charles Barkley. Ah, charades. The game that has destroyed thousands of relationships without a single word needing to be said. Jimmy loves to bring celebrities out on his show to play some strange games, but sometimes he likes to go with the classics. For this segment, the game was played by Ewan McGregor, Jeff Tweedy from the band Wilco, and Charles Barkley. Charles was on Jimmy's team and he suffered dearly for it. It turns out his skills as a charades detective are, well, non-existent. Jimmy attempts to get Charles to guess the title Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles by performing elaborate kung fu moves and telling Charles that there were four words in the title. After 10 seconds of chops and kicks, Charles guesses confidently, the karate kid. The buzzer sounds and the round is lost. This is when Jimmy literally yells at Charles Barkley in frustration, telling him that he was clearly a ninja and yelling, I said four words. Charles is stunned, sitting on the couch and trying to piece together how he's gonna break this man in half. 
When Charles stands to take his turn, he tells Jimmy that he is awful, getting the phrase ice ice baby. He does everything that he can to relay it to Jimmy, but again, they fail. When Charles tells him the phrase, Jimmy screams in his face in confusion. Oh, who would have thought that it's difficult to guess something in charades? <laughs> Seriously, I hate that game. Number eight, Rami Malek. Rami Malek is an incredible actor, being the star of the show Mr. Robot, as well as starring in several Hollywood hits like The Night at the Museum, and of course his Oscar winning performance in Bohemian Rhapsody as the leader of Queen, Freddie Mercury. While making rounds to promote the film, he stopped by Jimmy Fallon's show for a little chit chat. Initially, the interview is very pleasant, with Jimmy talking about how much he loved the movie and his performance in it. But then Jimmy pulls out the old Fallon charm and tells Rami that if he had access to his email or phone number that he would have called him to tell him how good he was. Yeah, Rami then reminded Jimmy that he did in fact have all of that information. There is a brief moment of silence before Jimmy becomes lost for words. Rami is smooth and laughs this one off, but only a few moments later, he touches Jimmy's hands after spoiling a scene for the movie. Jimmy's reaction shifts from a great mood to, Ugh, don't touch me. He looks like Rami just spit in his palm and gave him the old how you doing. Jimmy didn't explode on camera, but considering the allegations being brought against his show, he probably took a bath and sanitizer after this one. Number 7, Dakota Johnson. Jimmy has been the host of The Tonight Show since 2014. You would think in the almost 10 years that he's been on air that he would learn to let his guests speak. While doing promotions for the final entry in the 50 Shades franchise, she popped by The Tonight Show to chat with Jimmy Fallon. As the interview progresses, Dakota starts to tell Jimmy a story about her personal life that has nothing to do with the film. Throughout, he continues to interrupt her with little, oh, really? Wow, that's crazy. Eventually, she asks if she was allowed to speak, to which Jimmy said, Yes, when you know what you are talking about, what are you saying? He then abruptly moves on to his planned topics. The interview was short and filled with uncomfortable moments, but Dakota was a trooper and ignored this snub from Jimmy. Number 6, Martin Short and Steve Martin. Steve and Martin are comedy legends. Together, they starred in live shows, films, and TV for over 30 years. Recently, they've had a little career resurgence thanks to the success of their show, Only Girders in the Building. I'm not allowed to say the real title. It's available on Disney Plus now. While doing promotions for season two of the series, they stopped by Jimmy's show during the holidays. Instead of spreading Christmas cheer, though, the interview became a roast of the three men. Steve and Martin were aiming most of their insults at Jimmy, telling him he had the easiest show to fall asleep to. One of the better roasts was Martin saying, Jimmy, I love your career. It's like crypto. I don't understand it, but I admire it. Steve then chimed in, telling Jimmy that his beard looked like a face mask with a hole in the middle. Jimmy giggles throughout the entire thing, but instead of clapping back, he just moves on to the next question. Every time they try to have fun with Jimmy, he gives them nothing back. This isn't the most uncomfortable interview in the world for Steve or Martin, but for Jimmy, this was not a proud moment in the show's history. Number five, Joaquin Phoenix. Joaquin is known for being a bit of an eccentric character in general, but when it comes to his interviews, he is either calm, cool, and collected, or just completely out of his mind. In 2018, he appeared on The Tonight Show in a very good mood and ready to just kind of exist with Jimmy for a bit. The interview gets off to a rocky start when Jimmy reminds Joaquin of his last time on the show. The two had been trying to kick habits at the same time, to which Joaquin said, yours was way worse than mine. And after a pause, Jimmy says, oh, no, 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 not that one, a different one, I meant soda. Suggesting that maybe he was addicted to like no-no snow or something behind the scenes. Hmm. But while people were scratching their heads, Joaquin began talking about video hypnosis, which is a technique used to stop inhaling the nasty tobacco. The conversation drifts to Jimmy thanking Joaquin for being on the show, and Joaquin attempts to say something nice, but instead goes with, yeah, it is what it is, sips his coffee cup. The awkward laughing between these two is what made up a majority of the interview. That culminated in Jimmy telling Joaquin his name was too long to pronounce, and he replied by reminding Jimmy about the hundreds of people that he's met on the show and said, hey man, I believe in you." Number four, Pete Davidson. Pete made history as the youngest cast member on Saturday Night Live, but he's better known now as the guy who will steal your girl. In 2018, he made his late night debut, sitting with the Batman star Robert Pattinson to discuss his engagement to Ariana Grande and his time on SNL. 
At one point, the conversation goes to Jimmy suggesting that the late night show stage may be the best place to get married. Davidson flipped the switch and asked, why so many people even cared about the situation? They weren't dating him, so there's no reason to like be involved in the wedding. He then told Jimmy how weird it was that Donald Trump was being arrested for sleeping with people. Meanwhile, the media wanted to know where they were having their wedding. Throughout the interview, Davidson swears over and over again, causing Jimmy to just jokingly fire him from the show. Luckily, the awkward exchange was not a real ban of any kind, and Davidson returned every time he has dated someone new. 27 times in five years. I'm just just kidding. It's 28. Number three, Nicole Kidman. In 2016, Nicole Kidman popped by the old couch and desk set to talk about her upcoming film, Lion. However, Jimmy had other ideas. From the moment that she enters the room, he laughs nervously. As the interview progresses, Jimmy shares that the pair had actually met before, to which Kidman said, <laughs> oh, I remember. It turns out that Nicole had actually had a crush on Jimmy. Two years prior to the interview, Nicole actually attempted to go on a date with him, having a mutual friend set them up. But the late night show host blew his chance. According to Nicole, she showed up at his house where he just didn't talk to her and he played video games for an hour before she finally gave up and left. Jimmy claimed that he was unaware that this was an actual date, but judging by his actions, he probably thought it was a play date. His mom set up or something. Doesn't matter if you knew that or not, if Nicole Kidman knocks on your door, you pause the Fortnite, man. The overall interview was fairly uncomfortable, but this was a moment that truly made us cringe. Number two, Blake Shelton. Having someone look you in the eyes and sing to you is just so uncomfortable, especially on late night television. In 2017, Blake was on Jimmy's show to discuss his upcoming gig as the musical guest on Saturday Night Live. He kicks off the interview by heckling Blake over the cover of his 11th studio album, Texoma Shore. What started as lighthearted humor turned into full on roasting before Blake tries to move things along. He was there to talk about SNL, but before Jimmy gets a chance to discuss the soundtrack that he's gonna play, he sings a broken version of one of Blake's songs just right to his face. He even gets the audience to clap along while he butchers the lyrics. The entire time, which is a full minute, Blake looks extremely uncomfortable, just shaking his head and waiting for Jimmy to stop. When he finally does, Jimmy moves to a different topic, but the singer is visibly annoyed with not just the lack of knowledge for his lyrics, but the fact that Jimmy was singing in a hard cowboy accent. Eventually, Blake asks if Jimmy could just interview him already, finally getting things back on track. And at number one, Donald Trump. Donald Trump's interview with Jimmy Fallon will go down in the history books as the most awkward moment ever recorded. In 2016, while still campaigning for president, he appeared on The Tonight Show to discuss the future and his upcoming rally. Jimmy took advantage of the fact that Donald may be the president the next time that they spoke, asking if he could mess Donald's up hair while they're both still civilians. At first, Donald looks beyond annoyed, and like he may just snap at Jimmy right on camera. The audience roars with cheers though, which really seemed to shift his tone. He lets Jimmy ruffle his hair, only to reveal that he either got hair plugs or maybe he is just always wearing a wig. His hair looks like Jimmy Neutrons for a moment. A moment that went viral online. Despite him winning the election, this interview, and of course the photos that came from it, were the only thing on anyone's mind, and probably the only thing he's still remembered for now. Number 10, partying too hard. Joe has not been doing himself any favor since the announcement of this divorce. In the past few days, he's made several claims as to the reason that Sophie may have decided to leave him. Originally, the world was under the assumption that Joe had possibly cheated on her, but according to Joe, the reason was her partying lifestyle didn't mesh with his stay at home lifestyle. The claims have been disputed and called silly, as not only has Sophie rarely been seen out and about as much as her hubby Joe, but she said a dozen times over the years that she is a homebody and a super massive major introvert. Meanwhile, Joe has been on tour for over a year and many fans have shared photos of him just living it up. For someone claiming that they prefer to stay home, this guy really sure does like to splurge. Not to mention he claims that Sophie has been behaving like this since they first got married. It only took four years for her to leave. Yeah, that makes no sense. In fact, she was pregnant and raising a kid for about half of their relationship. When would she have had time to party? Well, it turns out she might have time now because she was photo
photographed living it up in the UK this weekend, clearly taking some time off to let out some steam. Number 9. Not getting Game of Thrones Sophie rose to mainstream stardom when she was just 13 years old, playing the role of Sansa Stark on Game of Thrones. HBO found a gem when they casted Sophie, and thanks to her performance and that of her incredible co-stars, the show received 8 seasons and launched her career. One person who did not get that show at all was her husband Joe Jonas. Early on in their relationship, Sophie was nervous about losing Joe if they were to spend extended time away from each other. Her concerns were not shared by Joe, as he was pretty oblivious as to exactly how popular the series was. Joe's had mixed opinions on the show, revisiting it from time to time, but as he got closer with Sophie, he became more and more uncomfortable with watching the show. Now, I've personally never watched more than maybe a handful of episodes, but in those handfuls, I saw, well, handfuls of bits and bobs that you're not usually supposed to see on TV. Then there is, of course, the graphic scenes of both lovemaking and, you know, fighting, so I can imagine why Joe might not love this show. Game of Thrones is Sophie's baby, so when Joe talks about the show, you can see her visibly disappointed in what he's saying. Hey, Joe, if you want to roast Game of Thrones, do it online like everybody else does. Number 8. She's messing with a gold digger. According to an inside source close to this couple, Joe was beyond excited when he started dating Sophie, and it sounds like it might be because of her money. According to the source, one of the main reasons that Joe is so smitten with his ex-man wife is because she is able to provide for herself and for him. Sophie does not let Joe pay for things most of the time, something that the musician is not used to, but has clearly taken advantage of over the years. When speaking about his wife in interviews, Joe kind of backed up this gold digging theory as the first and foremost thing he mentions is how much he loves her independence, cause you know she buys him stuff all the time and he loves it. While many praise Sophie for her efforts, many people began pointing out this red flag and expressing their discomfort, knowing that Joe Jonas doesn't pay the bill when he's out with his lady. Maybe that's why they're getting divorced, she kept tabs and the bill finally came due. This man has just slowly been milking her for everything she's got. Think about all the places that they've traveled as a couple, this dude must have gotten away with millions. Number 7. Cheating on Honor. The current tea spilling across the internet is that Joe Jonas is entirely to blame for the situation happening between himself and Sophie. The initial reports that came from Joe and his PR team was that the relationship was irretrievably damaged. There were no specifics, but he was making it sound like something truly terrible had happened. Usually when someone shares something like this, it means a cheating scandal or something possibly worse. But Joe released a statement claiming that she was leaving him so she could party it up without him dragging her down. Fans and Sophie herself were quick to remind Joe that she doesn't flock to the club like he does, as previously mentioned. While she was partying in the UK this past week, it seems like it was just for celebratory reasons. It's now been confirmed that something most definitely happened in the realm of cheating. The exact details are unknown, but many speculate that the entanglement took place only a few months ago, as Joe was photographed without his wedding band for a short period of time, but only days before the divorce announcement, it had magically returned. Number 6. Hesitate Joe wrote what is considered to be the sweetest love song of all time for Sophie Turner. While the song Hesitate is a slow jam that's worth your listening time, the actual lyrics had some people raising some pretty serious red flags. The highlights of the lyrics include kiss the tears right off your face, time heals if we work through it, and I promise we will figure this out. All of these sound like examples of Joe trying to say, hey, I'm sorry I've hurt you, but we can fix this together. What did he do? There were never any cheating scandals reported before the divorce was announced, but this song clearly sounds like him apologizing for some serious infidelity. Or did he just want to start a rumor himself? The lyrics have been broken down by super fans, not by me, <coughs> lame. Many Jonisians have theorized that Joe included the revealing lyrics on purpose to create this fake story. These days, relationships are at the top of the media storm. This year alone, we've seen over 20 chaotic public divorces play out. The current news is that Joe did, in fact, fall back into his cheating ways, and this may have been the thing that finally sent Sophie off the edge and Joe out the front door. Number 5 flirting in front of her. When these two first got together, it was believed that Joe had all of the leverage. Now why? Well, apparently Sophia was into him for quite some time, but she was aware that Joe was not known for his commitment skills. When they first met, he was a player. According to several women, he was seeing them simultaneously and without each other's knowledge. Joe's tone shifted when he met Sophie, and by December of 2016, he was becoming a one-woman kind of guy. According to Sophie, they were intoxicated.
intoxicated with each other and began dating exclusively. However, it appears that he was playing the field for so long that he forgot to turn off his game. Joe was constantly flirting with women at his shows, and now while it may have been accidental, the fact that he's not aware of what he's doing is definitely cause for concern. Number 4. Dissing the X-Men to Sophie's Face For those who may not remember, Sophie has actually been a part of a few major motion projects. Now, while she's mainly known for her role in Game of Thrones, many Marvel fans may know her as Jean Grey from the last two X-Men movies released by Fox. According to Joe himself, when he first saw Sophie in X-Men Apocalypse, they were still very fresh into their relationship. However, they were close enough for Joe to just roast the movie from start to finish right to her face. The world collectively agreed that Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix are terrible movies. If you haven't seen them, just trust me. But that Sophie and the cast overall are not the problem. But that didn't matter to Joe. In what has been described as a full-on rant, Joe told Sophie that the movie was a waste of time. He claimed that it was an insult to superhero movies and that she should be thankful that Fox got sold to Disney. Ouch. Sophie took the insults and stride and bounced back with reminding Joe that she was in a movie. Even his own brother Nick has acted more than Joe has, and he was a Disney kid. Number 3. Forcing her to stay in America Sophie Turner was born in the United Kingdom in Northampton. Ever since she made it big in the States, it's been her dream to return to the UK to live permanently and raise her family. Joe is completely against that idea. From the time they were together right up until this past week, the idea of moving to the other side of the globe with his wife was just not something that excited the pop star. Sophie has spoken out about the issue several times over the years, but never really got into the specifics. It turns out that while the Jonas Brothers are world famous, Joe is of course more comfortable on his home turf, which is the exact same thing that Sophie's trying to get at. He tore down any hope she had of living with him and their child, so it looks like she decided to just do it on her own instead. Number 2. Tried to ride her coattail As Joe's relationship with Sophie progressed, he started showing his true colors. While Sophie has not starred in many projects since becoming a mom, deciding to take time off to focus on herself and her family, Joe spends the majority of his time on a bus with his crew. Apparently the decision to not be a stay at home dad was one that he made the moment they got together. Throughout her entire pregnancy, an insider close to Sophie revealed that Joe was trying to get acting gigs based on her recommendations. While this woman was literally growing their spawn, he was like, so can I be in the next X-Men movie? Like, come on, guy, you were on the Disney Channel. You're telling me you can't walk into an office and just smile? How do you think Nick Jonas got a role in Jumanji? His acting skills? No. It feels like his decision to go on tour was an act of spite. One of the main things that Sophie was worried about from day one was a distance due to work, and look where they are now. And at number one, they called off their marriage as a joke. Joe and Sophie tied the knot in Las Vegas after publicly claiming several times that they were in no rush to get married. Now, after telling the world that they'd be taking time off for themselves following the engagement, it was not less than a month later that they tied the knot and attended the Billboard Music Awards directly after getting their license. They went to a little wedding chapel in Las Vegas that's famous for its star weddings like Britney Spears' marriage to her friend Jason Alexander that lasted about two days. What many people may not know is that only one day before the ceremony, Sophie and Joe got cold feet and actually broke up. While the idea came from a mutual place, Joe was apparently under the impression that this was a prank that she was trying to pull. Get him out to the desert and abandon him. <laughs> Hilarious. When they did eventually get back together, Sophie was just shocked at Joe's assumptions. If Sophie had never reached out, how long was Joe going to run with the bit? Number 10. The Literal Warnings from Viewers Despite 8 Passenger's popularity during its run, Frank's parenting style drew scrutiny and allegations of mistreatment from viewers very early on. Following a viewers change.org petition to have the Franks investigated, Utah's division of and family services visited the Franks' home and interviewed the children for two hours. According to a DCFS letter reviewed by Insider, the case was dropped due to a lack of evidence for the allegations. In an interview with the same outlet in 2020, Frank explained, What people aren't understanding is that we are giving our children choice in everything. We are teaching our children to be self-governing, so I was always very open with our son that he gets to choose how long he's separate from his brother, depending on his behavior. One is incident that concerned viewers occurred when the Frank's daughter Eve went to school one day without her lunch. In a vlog, Ruby recalled a text message that she received from Eve's teacher asking whether she would be able to drop off some food to school and Ruby responded with, Eve is responsible for making her own lunches in the morning so the natural outcome is 
she's gonna be hungry. Hopefully nobody gives her food and nobody steps in and gives her lunch. You ever just wanna like throw someone off a cliff? Number nine, filmed herself. One of the biggest red flags of all is her obliviousness to what she has been doing. Not only did this woman mistreat her family, she filmed the entire thing. Seriously, someone must have told her that she was the best vlogger around because despite being an actual piece of trash come to life, she continued to film every single terrible thing she ever did and shared it with the world. I'm not gonna get too deep into it because I can't talk about it. She has filmed herself making her cry, demanding that they apologize for little things and literally calling them liars. Her eldest have even gone so far as to disown their mom, removing her as the legal guardian. According to the eldest, they have been trying to call their mom out for years, but their cries fell on deaf ears. Finally being vindicated and seeing justice play out. Number eight, her channel. Per Fox 13, Frank and her husband, Kevin Frank, are a Mormon couple and parents of six Cherie, Chad, Abby, Julie, Russell, and Eve. In 2015, the couple started the Eight Passengers channel on YouTube that documented the family's daily life. According to NPR, the most viewed clips from the channel showed the experiences growing up, such as them trying on clothes and being disciplined. At the height of its popularity, Eight Passengers had 2.5 million subscribers, only it was shut down this year. The main cause of the shutdown was the fact that those 2.5 million viewers were extremely concerned for the family and were noticing patterns of mistreatment from day one. Ruby thought she was popular for being a good parent, but people were just watching her videos in disbelief that a person this dense actually existed. Number seven, she's withholding. If Ruby knows how to do one thing wrong, it's be a parent. Since being arrested, thousands of fans have released video evidence of her being horrible over the years. One of her biggest overreactions that was documented was her refusal to celebrate Christmas one year to teach her a lesson about being selfish. Ruby literally showed them all of the gifts that she bought them and never gave them to the kids. She also refused to bring her daughter lunch one day after accidentally leaving it at home, like I talked about earlier. Literally keeping food from the mouth of the person you're supposed to feed. It's disgusting. This woman deserves all the hate she is receiving and I hope she gets put away for a very, very long time. Number six, neighbors warned CPS. In the aftermath of Frank and Hildebrandt's arrests, two unidentified neighbors of Ruby Frank in Springfield, Utah, spoke to NPC News, revealing that some people in the neighborhood earlier contacted the Utah Division of Child and Family Services over concerns about the welfare of the kids. Frank's neighbors also alleged that she began spending more time away from her home after she got involved with the company Connections. An anonymous source told NBC News that Frank kicked her husband Kevin out of their house last year. People have reached out to lawyers representing Kevin Frank, but they did not immediately hear back. So it's unclear if Frank or Hildebrand have retained attorneys to speak on their behalf at this very moment. Number five, her advice is terrible. Despite being a famous family vlogger, most people think her advice is just trash. The woman behind eight passengers, AKA the devil, is known for spouting some absolute nonsense. She shared her so-called parenting advice on her YouTube channel, which was basically ignore your when they cry for help and no pranks in the house. One of her most controversial comments slash bad advice was suggesting that eating disorders were something made up for attention and are something to be ignored entirely. Anyone who's ever suffered from an eating disorder before knows for a fact that that's not the case. In fact, most times it's something uncontrollable, like a reaction to some serious life stuff. Stress, anxiety, literally so many things can cause that issue. She has said a million things that are wrong and cruel, but I'm not gonna get into all of them because my head might physically explode. I don't like this lady. Number four, her business partner. Following eight passengers, Frank launched the Connections podcast with Jody Hildebrandt, a therapist and founder of a self-improvement and empowerment company of the same name. According to the company's mission statement on its website, they invite and encourage healing and facilitate personal growth through impeccable honesty, rigorous personal responsibility, and humility. Okay. Per USA Today, viewers describe both Frank and Hildebrandt's philosophy on parenting as extremely strict. In an April 2023 interview with the Into the Light podcast recorded before her mother's arrest, Cherie Frank explained that her family's involvement in the Connections Company was a reason for her estranged relationship. She said that they joined Connections so that they could be growth oriented. However, over time, according to her, Connections teachings became more extreme and made her wonder if 
they were in accordance with her Christian beliefs. Her business partner is also involved in the arrest as she is suspected to not only have knowledge of the mistreatment, but that she actively encouraged it. Number three, uncomfortable family. The proof that this woman was a literal monster comes from her interactions with her own family. Over the years, whether it's been online or in her own personal life, Ruby really likes to just document everything that happens for the cameras. Every time someone from her life is on camera, they just look immediately uncomfortable. They always seem to be taken off guard and in fear of what this woman might say next. In family portraits taken over the years, you can literally see Ruby with an iron grip on her as if she's going to like pick them up and walk away the moment the photo is taken. Since the news of her arrest has come out, her eldest children have come forward to confirm their mother's behavior over the years, claiming that family photos meant everyone make mom look good or else. This woman is terrible and I'm not gonna try to be funny here because there's just no reason to be. She's terrible, that's it, she's, just, she's terrible. Number two, pranking. Ruby may be known for her strict parenting skills, but in May of this year, she posted a video with her son Chad titled, What We Haven't Told You. This video may have been the first red flag and honestly, should have been. In the video, Chad confessed that he was forced to sleep on a beanbag chair for seven months in their basement as a punishment for tricking his little brother into thinking the family was going to Disneyland. This was something that had recently happened, as Chad mentioned that he was just given his room back a few weeks prior to filming the video, and that video came out in May of this year. Chad told the story of the prank, and while it's cruel for sure, his mother's reaction is beyond extreme. According to Ruby, this was not the main reason she had forced him into the chair, claiming that he had been behind some extreme jokes on his younger siblings, but while they laughed this off initially, nobody thought this was funny, and thousands of comments were left claiming that this was just another form of neglect. Now, neglect is not the right word to use here, but I'm not allowed to say the real one on the internet. And at number one, she's TikTok famous. TikTok is the reason that some truly terrible people have a massive following around the world. Ruby is one of those people. Over the years, to boost her views, Ruby has been posting TikToks with either edited footage from her YouTube channel or just straight up something that she made at home. While the videos have amassed millions of likes and views, it's not for the right reasons. The videos that are most popular see her giving either terrible parenting advice or showcasing just how horrible this woman really is. Her reaction to her behavior is truly something to behold. It seems like everything they do deserves just an overreaction. In one TikTok with over 11.3 million views, Ruby is scolding her youngest for not being excited about going to the movies, literally forcing her to smile and apologize. Several other TikToks showcase her reacting to her family and them having this face of just sheer terror. Every other day, she was tormenting the people she loved loved and treating them like dirt. Number 10, Angelina Jolie. You would imagine that two people who consider themselves to be humanitarians would agree on something, but apparently that is not the case between Angelina Jolie and Miss Oprah Winfrey. According to an insider close to Oprah, Angelina actually refused to help her launch her Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for girls in South Africa. According to the source, Oprah reached out seeking celebrity sponsorships and public backing for the project. But when she reached out to Angelina, she was met with a swift no. Oprah assumed that Angelina, of all people, would jump at the chance to represent such an incredible cause, especially considering how much Angelina apparently loved Africa. But the no was a devastation and she would never ask for Angie's help ever again. Many people believe that the hate towards Oprah stems from her decision to publicly side with Jennifer Aniston after she split from Angie's ex, Brad Pitt. Hey, uh, to be fair to Oprah, the split came literally weeks before Brangelina became public, so I'm just saying. Number nine, Ice Cube. Ice may have gotten his career thanks to his epic music chops, both as a solo artist as well as during his time with the NWA, but these days you probably know him as the guy from Ride Along or 21 Jump Street. Ice Cube started acting in movies in 1991, debuting in the film Boys in the Hood as Doughboy. He continued to act over and over again, starring in movies like Friday, Anaconda, and Are We There Yet? His dislike for Oprah comes from the fact that while he has starred in several movies, and has become more wildly known for that, she has never invited him onto her show. She's even asked his co-stars to appear rather than himself on multiple occasions. In 2006, Ice Cube expressed his frustrations, saying that his barbershop co-stars Cedric the Entertainer and Eve were invited onto the show while he was left onto the sidelines. He pointed out how crazy it is that Oprah has all of these people with dark pasts and straight up convictions, plus if he wasn't a rags to riches story, who the heck was? We got a little piece of that story in the film Straight Outta Compton in 2015, which is a film that received massive critical success and that was never mentioned on Oprah's show. Ever. Not once. Number eight, Seal. 
This man may be known for his vocal chops, but he should be known for his meme making abilities. Just days after the Golden Globes in 2018, Seal posted a meme on Instagram consisting of several photos of Oprah Winfrey cozying up with a man whose name I am not allowed to say on the internet because he's so heinous. He's the guy who produced half of Quentin Tarantino's movies, he's the main cause of the Me Too movement, and for the rest of this entry he shall be referred to as Java the Hutt, cause he kinda looks like him. Oprah and Java were photographed spending time together, and one photo even made it look like Oprah was pushing singer Rita Ora towards Mr. Hutt. Seal captioned the image saying a bunch of stuff that I can't quote, gosh darn internet. The meme itself read, when you have been part of the problem for a decade, but suddenly they all think you are the solution. I'm not sure how deep this feud goes, but on the surface it seems that Seal has been trying to warn us that something is going on for quite some time. Number 7, Ludacris. Luda. Sorry, I just needed to get that out of my system. Ludacris appeared on Oprah in 2004 to promote the film Crash. He claimed that Oprah ambushed him. With criticism about hip hop lyrics instead of talking about the actual critically acclaimed movie that he was there to plug. Luda has since claimed that Oprah edited the show to make herself seem more favorable to the audience members. And he said during a separate interview that she edited out all of his comments and kept her own in. Of course, it's her show, but they were doing a show on racial discrimination and she gave Luda a hard time as a rapper when he came on the show as an actor. Luda revealed that his interview was extremely last minute, not knowing if it was a real thing until roughly 24 hours before. Following the interview on Oprah, she pulled Luda aside to the green room where he claims to have been berated by the talk show host. According to Oprah, having a rapper on her show made her feel like she was empowering them. He said it was like being at someone's house who just really didn't want you there. At that point, he had already been so uncomfortable, but that was just a little bit a cherry on top of the, of the Sunday. Her main concern was his use of the N-word in lyrics, but he quickly pointed out the hypocrisy of having people like Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock on the show who were famous for using that slur in their sets. Oprah's shadiness was on full display following the interview from Luda. Nope, I, I can't say it normally. I'm sorry. Number six, Monique. The beef between comedian and actress Monique and Oprah Winfrey dates back to 2010. Monique won an Oscar for her performance in Precious from 2009, and leading up to the film's premiere, Winfrey interviewed Monique's brother, Gerald, who Monique claimed to have been very physical towards her growing up in a truly dark way that I really can't get into. In a since-deleted Periscope video, Monique claimed that she gave Winfrey her blessing to do the interview, but was shocked and disgusted when her parents were in the audience. In the years that followed, Monique eventually forgave Gave Oprah for creating such an uncomfortable moment for herself and her family, and while forgiving Oprah, she does continue to say that she would never forgive her parents for the role that they played and for not doing something about the situation that was happening right under their noses. Oprah really needs to stop bringing people on the show to talk about some dark stuff. It's just not fun. It's just not fun. Number five, Whoopi Goldberg. In author Kitty Kelly's unauthorized Oprah biography, Kelly claims that Whoopi Goldberg became a persona non grata, aka an unwelcome person, to Oprah after Whoopi was nominated for an Oscar for her role in The Color Purple. The book noted that following the honor, the comedian never appeared on Oprah's show again and was noticeably shunned from her 2006 Legends Ball. It wasn't until Oprah invited the entire cast of The Color Purple onto the show that the so-called feud was addressed. It turns out that Oprah had actually ran into Whoopi at Tyler Perry's party sometime after the 2006 snub. Goldberg confronted Oprah, leading to a hilariously adorable moment between them. She asked Oprah why she was mad at her, to which Oprah replied, Why am I mad at you? I thought you were mad at me! They mutually agreed that they really should have just picked up the phone a long time ago and settled the dispute, so to say. Number four, David Letterman. A majority of the world believes that Oprah's feud with David Letterman dates back to 1995 after he made an awkward joke at the Academy Awards. But Letterman claims that their beef actually started a lot earlier than that. According to an interview between David and late night host Jon Stewart, David claims that his feud with Oprah began many, many years before the Oscars. He explained that he ran into Oprah when they were both on vacation with other people. He explained that she was with Stedman at the time and David was with his then girlfriend, Regina. David decided it would be really funny to prank Oprah one day at lunch. The story goes that the waiter walked past him and he simply pointed to Oprah and said, this woman right over there has been kind enough to take care of our checks. And then they got up and left Oprah 
Oprah with the bill. Yeah, I'm not surprised that she's not stoked about that. Even millionaires don't appreciate sneaky people. Winfrey has never cited that as being the source of her anger though. Apparently she felt that the feud began when she was a guest on his talk show in 1986. David continued to make rude jokes at her expense and made her feel extremely uncomfortable. She did not speak to him for 16 years after that. David is a strange man, especially when it comes to female guests, so it's not a surprise that she was uncomfortable the whole time. Number three. 50 Cent. The rapper once referred to Oprah as an Oreo in the January 2006 issue of Elle magazine, complaining that the talk show Queen started out with the views of a black woman, but was now catering to the middle-aged white American woman for so long that she became one herself. His words, not mine. Cent even named his miniature schnauzer Oprah as a dig at the talk show host. During an episode of Oprah's The Next Chapter, Cent was invited on to discuss the situation and clear the air. Oprah visited 50 at his grandmother's house for the interview, where he explained that his frustrations lied with Oprah's lack of hip hop artists on her show and just how much she detested the use of the N word. He claimed that he had seen moments on the show when she would discuss her feelings on rap culture and everything that was wrong with it, going on to say that she would occasionally target his music directly. According to Scent, he called Oprah his enemy in the exchange and he has never spoken to her again. Number two, Joan Rivers. The late Joan Rivers actually publicly fat shamed Oprah Winfrey on live television during her first ever live TV appearance. Great way to start a relationship. Oprah spoke out about the incident in her book Food, Health, and Happiness, and in one entry she tells the story of appearing on The Tonight Show in 1985. All was going smoothly and she was starting to settle into her role, and that was when she was asked the one question she did not prepare for. Joan Rivers asked Oprah how she gained the weight. According to Oprah, she was just stunned because Joan just asked her on live TV how she was so fat. Her words, not mine. I'm not calling Oprah fat. We do not fat shame here, obviously. Joan was acting as a guest host at the time, sitting behind a desk that was not hers, telling Oprah that she was fat. That is like next level rude. In the years that followed, Joan claimed that she loathed Oprah, allegedly calling her rise to fame completely opportunistic. For years, she believed that Oprah's only so-called claim to fame was her gift to exploit people's suffering and emotions and turning them into TV ratings. Oprah has brought on a lot of people who are suffering from serious hardships, but this is a popular format for many people like Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz. Man, there are a lot of doctors on TV, huh? Dr. Oprah, I guess that just didn't have a nice ring to it. And at number one, Chris Brown. Chris was in some hot water in 2009 after Oprah hosted a domestic violence episode in which she showed footage of Chris's infamous video involving his then girlfriend Rihanna. After the episode aired, Chris took his frustrations to People Magazine, which is a good place to go. He commended Oprah for addressing the fact that it was a problem, but that it was a slap in his face. He went on to tell people how much he had done for Oprah over the years, and how this was a massive betrayal, telling her to be more helpful. Okay, Mr. Brown. Oprah released a statement later saying that she was very appreciative of his help and charity, but that she takes domestic issues very seriously. Chris doubled down by retaliating against Oprah, telling her that she was bashing him and tearing him down rather than building him up. Well, we all know how most celebrities feel about Chris Brown these days, so I think she was in the right there. Number 10. Modeling Meltdown Cara has had a rough couple of years. The model slash actress sparked major concerns with a series of very disheveled public appearances in the past few years. A little while back, a distressing video of Cara at Van Wee Airport went viral, which showed the star behaving erratically and out of sorts. She was seen dropping her phone several times, she was shaking, and she was unable to stand still. But people really started to wonder what was going on when she failed to show up in New York City for the launch of her own fashion collection. She also didn't show up to the Emmy Awards alongside the cast of Only Miemies in the Building. I'm not allowed to say the actual title. Cara also came under fire for her behavior at the Billboard Music Awards in 2022, where she appeared to be following Megan the Stallion everywhere she went. Several of the model's antics ended up going viral following that show, including her peering around a corner and ducking in and out of Megan's photos while sticking her tongue out and shouting. Now, I don't know if that would be horrifying or hilarious. Now it's hilarious, I kinda wanna see that now. 
Number nine, the squad 2016. In 2016, Kara participated in one of the worst superhero movies to ever be made. The Suicide Squad was a wonderfully mediocre, by the numbers action movie that had the thinnest plot of all time. Kara played the main villain of the film, The Enchantress. Now, while she was nowhere near the worst person on camera, her decision to take the role in the first place was a major red flag for future producers. The worst part about the project was that there's actually this really good movie somewhere in the servers of DC, but the studio executives were so heavily involved that most of the director David Ayer's ideas were just kind of left on the cutting room floor. Do we still have cutting rooms? Kara has actually mentioned many times over the years since that she had a ton of fun on set of the film. She became very close with Harley Quinn, aka Margot Robbie, as well as Will Smith's mercenary character. The Enchantress spends most of the movie looking over a sky beam while her million-eyed minions take out the squad. As I said, her role wasn't even close to the reason this movie bombed so hard. The crew were just doing the best they could with what they had, but unfortunately this is one of the biggest movies that she's ever participated in, which made her a little questionable the studio executives. Number 8, Best Battle Rapper Around. In 2016, Kara took part in a segment on the late, great, late show with James Corden called Drop the Mic. Now, I truly had a difficult time scripting this entry because it's just so freaking funny, man. It's only seven minutes and I rewatched it three times. Now I'm not sure who wrote the words for this bit. Maybe it was them, maybe not, but these were some truly devastating roasts. She had some perfect comebacks to James Corden. James started off his battle rap with the lyrics, you're perfect for Suicide Squad, I'm being heartfelt because when I see you try to act, it makes me want to end myself. Harsh for sure, but Kara was quick to retaliate. She said, end yourself? You promise that's a fact? I've never heard of a better reason to act. I can see now the headlines all about me, Cara Delevingne, the woman who saved late night TV. Oh, it's just so good. Dave Franco was also involved in the rap battle, dropping some hardcore roasts on James and Kara. Now, I'm not gonna quote all of the highlights because this clip is genuinely worth your time to watch. Kara's quick comebacks had many audience members in awe. This woman understood the assignment. Unfortunately, a lot of people in Hollywood felt the words to be harsh on all parts. But Kara won the battle, so she really stuck out as the one to, you know, kinda watch out for. Number seven, distracts her co-stars. Kara is known to throw her co-stars off from time to time, but her true kryptonite is Margot Robbie. Kryptonite's the green stuff that Superman doesn't like. The pair starred together in DC's live action Suicide Squad, which I previously mentioned, and of course Margot portrayed the clown queen of Gotham, Harley Quinn, and she still does to this day, doing it super well. While Kara spends the majority of the film making a sky beam in the subway. The movie was awful, but it was not the fault of the cast, who actually worked really well together, and they were literally the only good thing about the movie. Since the cast worked so well on screen though, they decided to spend more time off screen together, even getting tattooed to commemorate their shoot. Uh, that, that's a tattoo they must regret now. Kara has been asked if she would ever collaborate with Margot on future DC projects, but has maintained that the chances of it happening are pretty unlikely. Not only did she despise the end result of Suicide Squad, but she's unable to maintain her composure around Margot, and just claims that she would break too often for it to be a smooth shoot. So, uh, James, James Gunn, hey, buddy, can you cast Kara in a sequel and give her less CGI this time? Can you, can you do that? That'd be great. Number six, John Hardy photo shoot. As many may know, Kara is famous worldwide for her beauty, being a model as well as an actress for most of her career. In 2014, she partook in a little photo shoot with John Hardy. The photos that came from the shoot were stunning, however the actual session to take the pics was a little bit different. When you see these models' photos, you automatically assume that they're taken during like a serious moment or that there was not a single giggle on set. Well, Kara could not stop laughing. The team encouraged her to be weird and silly, so she did exactly Exactly that. The footage from the shoot day shows Kara dancing in the sand, making goofy faces, and being the chaotic good that the world knows her as. The photos took a lot longer to take than most shoots though, but it was well worth the trouble. Maybe the reason that she won't get casted anymore is because she's so distracting and fun. That's a good reason. That's a very good reason. Number five, built-in detector. 
Okay, I'm sorry if you hate Cara Delevingne. If you made it here, you probably don't. That's great, because this entry is not for you if you hate her. This woman made me giggle so much while writing the script, especially this entry. This entry involved an interview between Cara, Margot Robbie, and Karen Fukuhara while promoting the release of Suicide Squad. These three together are just a ton of fun, and it's obvious why they all said that the production of the film was such a great environment, despite it being a terrible movie. Well, in the middle of the interview, the conversation somehow shifts to the topic of those, those little things that everybody has on their chests. You know, I can't say the name of it, but it rhymes with Ripple. Kara got so excited about the topic and said confidently that she could find anyone's Ripple in the moment, claiming to have a built-in Ripple detector. Margot challenges her to prove it, and Kara proceeds to pinch Margot, Karen, and the interviewer, Christine Gijbels, just just right on the ripple. She actually was pretty accurate. She found them like right away, proving that she does in fact have a built-in detector. I can't think of many celebrities who have done something like that and still looked good afterwards because that's usually associated with anger or something. But in this case, it just seems like Kara being Kara. Number four, Kara needs a Red Bull. Kara is a gifted actor and overall seems like a solid human being. So much like the rest of us, she gets tired and annoyed from time to time. Unfortunately, that feeling took place on live TV when she was promoting her movie Paper Towns. While making an appearance on the early morning show Good Day Sacramento, the interview did not get off to a great start. The program's anchor called her Carla and then she spent the next few minutes trying to get information out of Kara but was failing miserably. She was falling deep into those anchor role tropes, just like, hey, oh wow, that's amazing. Hey, listen, Carla, did you even read the book that this thing's based on? Or do you even have time to read? Because you're so busy. <laughs> She was very sarcastic with each answer to the fairly generic questions. Do you relate to the character? What was your favorite moment? Blah, blah, blah. It was then that a third anchor abruptly popped in and asked Kara if she was exhausted as she seemed to be a little bit more excited to talk about the project a few weeks prior in London. She giggled and said that she was fine. Apparently the premiere of the film had been the night before, which she claimed to feel like the end of an era. So she was just really emotionally drained. But the anchors do not know when to quit. And one of them then suggests that she may be irritated or maybe it was just them. <laughs> mm, no. They then cut the interview short and told her to take a nap and get a Red Bull. She can be heard saying that that's a bit too far before the news anchor screeches over her and they shut her down. Now according to Kara, there really was no bad blood here. She was just sick of answering the same questions over and over again and like I said, she was just emotionally drained. But following the interview, the guy who popped in and was like, hey, how are you doing? Was fired for causing such a tense situation on live TV. So it probably didn't look great that Kara got a dude fired for being, I don't know, herself. Number three, Planet X with Kara. Kara is the host of a Netflix series called Planet S-E-X with Kara Delevingne. And I feel like a child every time I have to spell that. Just let me say it. The series follows Kara exploring life's biggest questions about human lovemaking and examining issues with relationships, the consumption of adult films, and the physical appeal of person to person. The series is considered to be a refreshing documentary exploring something that not traditionally gets discussed every day. The show contains a good mix of scientific information as well as personal stories, and Kara is a wonderful host who finds it very easy to connect with her guests. The content of the series, though, has raised a few eyebrows, with the main concern being that it might tarnish her reputation as a serious dramatic actor. That was all bull though, as the show not only received incredible reviews, but she's even been praised for having the tough conversations. But hey, since the internet had a debate about it, I gotta put it on this list. Number two, Wired. The Wired autocomplete interview has become a very popular format online. Essentially, celebrities just kind of answer the most Googled questions online. Kara took her turn on the show while doing promotions in 2016. Her interview is not only one of the shortest ones to be posted on the channel, but it's also the most uncomfortable. There are a lot of questions that they could use for these interviews, but of course they're forced to use popular searches. And it turns out that the world has the most vanilla Google searches ever when it comes to Kara. Kara answers where she's from what she's been up to, all that jazz. Thankfully, Kara's bubbly personality made the interview just a little bit more exciting, but the only truly negative thing to come out of this one was the waste of her time filming it. Hey, if you made it this far into the video, I assume you realize that this woman is awesome, but hey, you wouldn't click a video called Top 10 Reasons Why Cara Delevingne is the Best. If you would, please tell us. We can do that. 
Number one, Silly Billy. Taking the top spot on this list is just the summarization of Kara as a person and probably the main reason that she's, you know, only worked here and there over the last few years. She's just a silly Billy. I know I'm supposed to hate on her, but she deserves none of it. In doing research for this video, I found so much footage of this woman making people's day brighter or making them laugh until they cry. And besides, a quick Google shows that she is in fact working pretty hard and is actually about to be in a season of American Horror Story with Kim Kardashian. And I wish them both all the luck in the world. There's already enough hate out there right now in the world, so for now, let's aim it at the people who actually deserve it. Like whoever keeps trying to make new Oreo flavors. The original one is fine. Those are the reasons the car won't get hired anymore. Are you sick of the bull? Well, let me know by dropping a comment on the video. Tell us what you want to see, and if you made it to the end, I honestly thank you very much. You rock, and I hope you have an incredible day. Thank you for stopping beyond the screen. Keep coming back for more juicy content, and we'll see you next time. This week, the talk show host and actress said that the program would be returning and would be in line with the rules of the strict guidelines. But the show's writers were among those who picketed the studio in New York after the show resumed filming. This past Tuesday, the National Book Foundation said it had rescinded Drew's invitation to host the National Book Awards, which I truly did not know was a thing. I just assumed that they slapped a New York Times bestseller sticker on the front and just kind of let it loose. But there is a very real ceremony that Drew is no longer welcome to attend. The foundation released a statement saying the National Book Awards is an evening dedicated to celebrating the power of literature and the incomparable contributions of writers in our culture. They went on to say, in light of the announcement that the Drew Barrymore show will resume production, the National Book Foundation has rescinded Miss Barrymore's invitation to host the 74th National Book Awards ceremony in New York. The move comes completely out of left field as before the controversy, the foundation praised her work. Drew is the author of several books, including a biographical piece called Wildflower, recounting her childhood. The book has received massive praise and, surprise surprise, was on the New York Times bestsellers list. The Writers Guild of America has been on strike since the beginning of May over concerns about pay, proper working conditions, and the use of artificial intelligence, with actors joining the strike in July in solidarity. The cast of Oppenheimer, one of the highest grossing films of this year, walked out of the Los Angeles premiere just to join the picket line in an attempt to spread awareness and showcase the impact that the strike had on Hollywood as a whole. Now, at the start of the strike, Drew stepped down as the host of her show, as well as the host for the MTV Film and TV Awards in solidarity with the striking WGA members. However, she has stated that she made the choice to return for the first time during the strike for the sake of the show. She said that the show may have her name on it, but that the whole situation was much larger than herself. She owned the choice and confirmed that the show had no intentions of operating against the guidelines set in place by the strike, namely the rule of promoting affected TV shows or films. She went on to say that the return to the show was her way of trying to provide what writers do so well, which is a way of bringing us together or help make sense of the human experience. The big wigs at CBS said that her show would not be performing any written work covered by the WGA strike, so Drew essentially signed herself up to write and star in the talk show. The show, which was set to return to air tonight, normally employed employs at least three writers who are members of the Writers Guild, members that picketed outside of the studio. Speaking on the picket line, one former writer, Chelsea White, said, First and foremost, this is obviously bigger than the Drew Barrymore show and its writers. And she continued to say that they were on the lines to stand with their union and were feeling great and just excited to be surrounded by so many creative minds. Chelsea informed us that Barrymore show was Writers Guild of America covered. It was a struck show that is planning to return without its writers, which is just a fancy way of saying she really shouldn't be putting it back on. A union representative told the press that the Guild has and will continue to picket struck shows that are in production during the writer strike. Any writing on the Drew Barrymore show is in violation of the WGA rules, something that our team literally said would not happen. What's odd is that Drew's position as a performer on the show was not in violation of anything that the rules had. According to CBS, the show is covered by some different actor's contract than the one that's currently in dispute. So the contract, which covers talk, game, 
and variety shows and soap operas was renewed by the union last year. So technically speaking, she's not breaking a guideline, but at the same time, she kind of is. Because while protected on the hosting side of things, writing her own material is super against the rules. Drew released a four minute long apology, taking full responsibility for her actions and giving her side as her decision on to restarting the show. She never meant to hurt anyone as she herself has been through some truly rough situations. She of course acknowledged the pain that she had caused people online and knew that there was nothing that she could say to make this better. She reminded the audience that the show was literally created and premiered in 2020 when we were all supposed to stay away from each other and it was literally built on sensitivity. But unfortunately, as she said, there is not much that can be said or done to make things right or solve this problem. The situation is unfortunate. Just to explain a little bit on what's happening with this strike, on March 7th of this year, 99% of members from the Writers Guild of America voted in favor of demands that included calls for increased compensation, better residual staffing requirements, and protection from artificial intelligence interfering with their jobs. Negotiations between the union and the alliance of motion picture and television production. Who would have guessed that the guys at the top making all the money wouldn't want to share the money with the people who made them rich? That's so shocking. The strike shut down everything in Hollywood. Films like Deadpool 3 were put on ice until the two sides could reach an agreement. The reason Drew Barrymore is receiving so much hate right now is because the strike also put live shows on ice. Saturday Night Live, Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, all of the Jimmys are on the picket lines waiting for their shows to recommence. Around the middle of July, the Screen Actors Guild and American Federation of Television and Radio Artists joined the picket line. All the actors joined in. That's what I mean. That's a long way of saying all of the actors were there now too, and I mean like all of the actors. Chris Hemsworth, the cast of Breaking Bad, Danny Trejo, aka Machete, even Cal Penn and John Cho, aka Harold and Kumar joined the lines. The failure to reach a settlement has resulted in over $3 billion hitting the California economy, and despite claims from the studios that their intentions are to reach a deal, they've continued to deny their workers the rights and will not even talk about the usage of AI in film, even though it's happening. Not to mention that during the strike, an insider at Hollywood Studios informed that the media that they actually had no plans on signing anything. In fact, one executive claimed that the end game was to allow things to drag on until the union members started losing their apartments and houses. The AMP publicly refuted the report, but come on, why would anyone admit to doing that? Drew's part in all of this is honestly pretty minimal, but her move to restart the show while negotiations have yet to take place has left a very sour taste in Hollywood's mouth. However, the hate may not be warranted, and if it is, it might not last long. The recent news from the picket lines is that the studios in the union have agreed to return to the table, and they're starting to maybe reach a settlement. I'm just gonna say this now, if you made it this far into the video, thanks a lot. It means the world when you actually pay attention and follow me through these topics, but hopefully if you made it past all this strike talk, then you might have a heart and care about what's happening. So again, thank you. You're a great person. And so is Drew Marymore. I'm not going to hate on this lady because her decision to resume the show was just a little off, but she's not that off. There is nothing wrong with wanting to work. I do it every day for this channel. But when your colleagues and close friends and business partners are all saying, hey, don't do that. That's not okay. You should probably listen to those people. Drew Barrymore's show is wonderful. There have been some awesome and truly candid moments with celebrities that probably would have never shared that side of themselves had it not been for Drew just being such a calming presence. Her interview with musician MGK still plays in my head constantly. This man was painting nails and expressing his emotions and hey, we love him for it. So there has been a new development though. Over this past weekend, Drew took to Instagram to tell the world that she actually changed her mind and would allow her show to remain cancelled. All the public backlash and surely the negative comments from her fellow performers were not helping the situation. She posted on Instagram saying that she heard our concerns and would be posting postponing the premiere until the strike is over. PR team at CBS praised the decision and so far it's looking like a lesson was learned and a statement was made. Hollywood will not back down. Normally I try to make jokes here and you know entertain you but honestly I do not feel okay with trying to make fun of the strike so let's end the video on a positive note. As I mentioned the negotiations are set to resume sometime this week. With this being one of the longest strikes in history many celebrities are very hopeful that the next round of negotiations will yield positive results. Streaming giants 
giants like Netflix, Disney Plus and Paramount have lost millions of dollars in possible ticket sales and several of their releases have been pushed back during the strike. So with any luck Drew's show and many others are going to be back in full swing very soon. Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher have become a major part of the media storm this week after their character letters to Danny Masterson were leaked to the public. Danny is on trial for the physical mistreatment of several women and he had been in custody since May but he was recently sentenced to 30 years in prison. Even after the slew of evidence and testimonies, Danny and his team have still publicly maintained his innocence. Well, Ashton and Mila were also under that impression when they wrote character letters to the judge overseeing his case, in which they described Danny as a decent man who was generous and kind. Mila chimed in and praised Danny, calling him an outstanding role model and a friend. The letters that were intended solely for the eyes of the judge were leaked into the press. They wrote these letters well after the controversy came to light, so not only were they aware of Danny's possible sentencing, but they still decided to back him up, hence the apology video. Over the weekend, the couple released a video apologizing for the statements they made in their letters that was just the fakest thing that you have ever seen in your life. Now, I'm going to break it down. It's tea time. First and foremost, Mila is an actress. Between herself and Ashton, it's pretty clear who's the busiest bee in the house. It's Mila. It's also obvious from the way Mila speaks that during the entire apology, it's just all lies. The whole thing is filled with the same old tropes as every other apology video ever put into the world. They understand the pain they've caused, they're sorry for their actions, blah blah blah. But you gotta hand it to these guys, they actually sound like they have their lines down pat. In case it isn't obvious, which... Come on, it is. They have clearly rehearsed this speech and they've got it down to under a minute. I'm not sure if they wrote it themselves though because the vocabulary that they use is very advanced. I'm sorry if I don't believe that Jesse from Dude Where's My Car wrote the sentence, full consideration relative to the sentencing. They actually might not be completely off script, however, because periodically throughout the video, you can see them looking off of camera, almost like they're reading cue cards on SNL. The video just proved that they had little to no remorse for their actions, believing that they were just trying to help a friend in need. At one point, they say they had no intention for the letters that they had written to be seen by anyone other than the judge. So their apology was more of a, oh, oh man, I'm sorry we got caught kind of thing. They're not actually sorry for anything they've said or done, they're just sorry that someone leaked their letters to the press. Like, listen, either apologize for something or don't, because when you try to make the whole justified apology thing, it's just plain rude. Supporting a man who is being accused by several women of something that is truly disturbing is a major red flag in our eyes. Mila looks so done the entire time, and she is overacting with each and every word she says. Meanwhile, Ashton seems just a little bit more calm cool and collected, but he really shouldn't be. Supporting Danny, especially when it comes to this situation, makes him look like a massive hypocrite. In case you were unaware, Ashton's been working with a company called Thorn since 2012, the company that he co-founded with Demi Moore that is designed to monitor the activity of underage folks online and prevent any criminal situations from taking place. The company has grown since and it still works to that goal to this day, which like, hey, that is awesome, keep people safe online way to go. But how are you going to create an entire company dedicated to preventing the exact thing that your buddy was arrested for? Ashton has been called out by many fans and victims of violence for his hypocritical actions. There is no word on how his company is handling the situation, but so far it's not looking like they have any reason to fire him just yet. Despite his buddy Danny being charged and sentenced to 30 years, he still seems to be holding back in his apology video. The video is after all just like one minute long, so we can only imagine how much stuff that this man actually had to say. His letter was very revealing. As I'll get into in a moment, Ashton and Mila have been well aware of Danny's controversy for quite some time, yet when asked to write character witness statements, they leaped at the opportunity to defend him. Both Ashton and Mila have always presented themselves as, you know, calm, cool, and collected people. But between Ashton's humanitarian work and Mila's career in comedy, they seemed like a wholesome Hollywood couple born from controversy. Yeah, Ashton was still married when he started seeing Mila, allegedly. But that's not my point. What we've come to learn in the last few weeks is that this couple may actually be super toxic, rude, and dismissive behind the scenes. There have been reports here and there, but they all run along the same pattern of they're terrible guests 
and they're always annoyed by everything. In fact, in a recent interview, past talk host Sharon Osbourne shared her encounter with Ashton a few years ago. While doing an interview for E!, she told the outlet that the rudest celebrity she had ever met was the guy who married the actress from that 70s show. When the host confirmed that she meant Ashton Kutcher, she called him a quote, rude, 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 rude little boy. The hosts were shocked as she went on to call him a dastardly little thing. Like, he's very focused on the little thing. She claimed that Ashton had been a guest when she was still working on the talk. He had a very bad attitude about everything. She said he was mad from the start and asked Sharon to list her credentials, trying to play the whole I'm more established than you are, so why am I here type thing. Sharon, of course, is the princess of darkness, being married to rock legend Ozzy Osbourne, so she put Ashton in his place, which he did not like. It would be no surprise to learn that Ashton is a mean man off camera. Think about some of the segments on his prank show, Punked. We just towed your car away and now you have to take the bus. Yes, you just got punked. That's a real thing that happened to somebody on camera. Ashton is not the only bad apple in this relationship. Mila is also known for being a pretty rude individual, especially when it comes to interviews. As with many celebrities, she likes to stay busy, but busy for her is acting. It's not talking about real stuff. She is known for being easily annoyed by very simple questions. In fact, when asked how she was feeling in one interview, she responded with, I don't talk about that for publication. Okay, a simple I'm good would have been okay, but whatever. Several interviewers found her to be dismissive, and she very clearly did not want to be there. Same with this apology video, Mila just looks annoyed. She's visibly confused as to why she has to make this video in the first place. Who was it benefiting? Why was it important? Well, lots of people and for several reasons. They apologize for a lot of things in this video, but as I previously touched on, they don't actually say Danny is a bad guy and we know that now. They apologize for the pain that the words that they've said have caused, claiming the goal was never to denounce the testimonies given in court. For these guys, it was just a letter about their buddy from that 70s show. But let's talk about that 70s show for a moment, because it was not all peaches and cream behind the scenes either. That 70s show was a popular sitcom that helped launch several careers, including Mila, Ashton, and Danny. Danny was of course on this show, but it turns out that the allegations against him dated back to 2004, where they were actually reported, like in 2004. Danny was still on the show when an investigation was taking place. Four women reported that he had mistreated them physically, prompting local law enforcement to halt production on the show and bring Danny in for questioning. The investigation brought little to no actual evidence to the table, so Danny was let go, and the entire thing was just kind of forgotten about. But that means that Ashton and Mila literally watched this dude go in for questioning and still called him a role model in their character witness letters. It makes no sense. Their jobs were literally stopped while this man was under investigation. And when the charges come up again over 15 years later, they still stick to his side. That 70s show was chock full of issues behind the scenes, because not only was Danny being investigated, but it turned out that Mila lied about her age just to get a role on the show. But she was already so deep into the run that they just didn't want to write her character out. Just imagine if things worked out differently. That 70s show would have just been two buddies in a basement hanging out. Just basically the premise of Dude, Where's My Car? Their letter may not have been intended to call the testimonies of the victims into question or whatever, but that's what happened. Plus, yeah, it's definitely what you were trying to do. The media has been covering the situation for a long time. Danny was brought into custody in May, but the allegations were actually brought up as far back as 2017. Between 2017 and now, Ashton and Mila have still decided that this man is a good dude and a role model. I still can't get past that statement. Role model for, what, not doing the right thing, maybe? Yeah. The apology only makes the entire situation situation that much worse. The overacting that takes place combined with the obviously fake apology makes them look even worse than they already are. It was just them telling us how sorry they were that things turned out this way. In an alternate universe, the letters made their way to the judge untouched, leaving Ashton and Mila to live in blissful ignorance. Now, there are so many reasons why this apology is meaningless and why it's so obviously a fake move made for like press coverage or something, from the bad acting to the cue cards to the I'm sorry we got caught angle. This is just the worst thing that these two could have done. Number 10, Cardi B. 
Cardi is well known for her quick wit and wicked throwing arm, but of course the world loves her for her lyrical talents. Jimmy clearly did not do any research on Cardi or what he could expect having her on as a guest. Cardi was in full, well, Cardi mode when she appeared on Jimmy's show in 2017. Jimmy welcomed her to the show, to which she replied with, Thank you! <laughs> yeah, this left Jimmy speechless. As Cardi begins the interview, Jimmy just has this look of concern on his face. She speaks with a hard Bronx accent and is very animated in her expressions and movements. He clearly asks the questions that are written on his cue card rather than actually engaging with her. And when he does actually attempt to get on her level, which was just him mimicking her reactions, literally saying brrrr is totally right. Jimmy just kind of went along with what she was saying. If you want to laugh, I suggest you watch the entire interview. It would take me a full like 20 minutes just to go through the highlights. Number 9, Charles Barkley. Ah, charades. The game that has destroyed thousands of relationships without a single word needing to be said. Jimmy loves to bring celebrities out on his show to play some strange games, but sometimes he likes to go with the classics. For this segment, the game was played by Ewan McGregor, Jeff Tweedy from the band Wilco, and Charles Barkley. Charles was on Jimmy's team and he suffered dearly for it. It turns out his skills as a charades detective are, well, non-existent. Jimmy attempts to get Charles to guess the title Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles by performing elaborate kung fu moves and telling Charles that there were four words in the title. After 10 seconds of chops and kicks, Charles guesses confidently, The Karate Kid. The buzzer sounds and the round is lost. This is when Jimmy literally yells at Charles Barkley in frustration, telling him that he was clearly a ninja and yelling, I said four words. Charles is stunned, sitting on the couch and trying to piece together how he's going to break this man in half. When Charles stands to take his turn, he tells Jimmy that he is awful, getting the phrase ice ice baby. He does everything that he can to relay it to Jimmy, but again, they fail. When Charles tells him the phrase, Jimmy screams in his face in confusion. Oh, who would have thought that it's difficult to guess something in charades? <laughs> Seriously, I hate that game. Number 8, Rami Malek. Rami Malek is an incredible actor, being the star of the show Mr. Robot, as well as starring in several Hollywood hits like The Night at the Museum, and of course his Oscar winning performance in Bohemian Rhapsody as the leader of Queen, Freddie Mercury. While making rounds to promote the film, he stopped by Jimmy Fallon's show for a little chit chat. Initially, the interview is very pleasant, with Jimmy talking about how much he loved the movie and his performance in it. But then Jimmy pulls out the old Fallon charm and tells Rami that if he had access to his email or phone number that he would have called him to tell him how good he was. Yeah, Rami then reminded Jimmy that he did in fact have all of that information. There is a brief moment of silence before Jimmy becomes lost for words. Rami is smooth and laughs this one off, but only a few moments later, he touches Jimmy's hands after spoiling a scene for the movie. Jimmy's reaction shifts from a great mood to, Ugh, don't touch me. He looks like Rami just spit in his palm and gave him the old how you doing. Jimmy didn't explode on camera, but considering the allegations being brought against his show, he probably took a bath and sanitizer after this one. Number 7, Dakota Johnson. Jimmy has been the host of The Tonight Show since 2014. You would think in the almost 10 years that he's been on air that he would learn to let his guests speak. While doing promotions for the final entry in the Fifty Shades franchise, she popped by The Tonight Show to chat with Jimmy Fallon. As the interview progresses, Dakota starts to tell Jimmy a story about her personal life that has nothing to do with the film. Throughout, he continues to interrupt her with little, oh, really? Wow, that's crazy. Eventually, she asks if she was allowed to speak, to which Jimmy said, Yes, when you know what you are talking about, what are you saying? He then abruptly moves on to his planned topics. The interview was short and filled with uncomfortable moments, but Dakota was a trooper and ignored this snub from Jimmy. Number 6, Martin Short and Steve Martin. Steve and Martin are comedy legends. Together, they starred in live shows, films, and TV for over 30 years. Recently, they've had a little career resurgence thanks to the success of their show, Only Girders in the Building. I'm not allowed to say the real title. It's available on Disney Plus now. 
While doing promotions for season 2 of the series, they stopped by Jimmy's show during the holidays. Instead of spreading Christmas cheer though, the interview became a roast of the three men. Steve and Martin were aiming most of their insults at Jimmy, telling him he had the easiest show to fall asleep to. One of the better roasts was Martin saying, Jimmy, I love your career, it's like crypto. I don't understand it, but I admire it. Steve then chimed in telling Jimmy that his beard looked like a face mask with a hole in the middle. Jimmy giggles throughout the entire thing, but instead of clapping back, he just moves on to the next question. Every time they try to have fun with Jimmy, he gives them nothing back. This isn't the most uncomfortable interview in the world for Steve or Martin, but for Jimmy, this was not a proud moment in the show's history. Number 5. Joaquin Phoenix Joaquin is known for being a bit of an eccentric character in general, but when it comes to his interviews, he is either calm, cool, and collected, or just completely out of his mind. In 2018, he appeared on The Tonight Show in a very good mood and ready to just kind of exist with Jimmy for a bit. The interview gets off to a rocky start when Jimmy reminds Joaquin of his last time on the show. The two had been trying to kick habits at the same time, to which Joaquin said, yours was way worse than mine. And after a pause, Jimmy says, oh, no, 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 not that one, a different one, I meant soda. Suggesting that maybe he was addicted to like no-no snow or something behind the scenes. Hmm. But while people were scratching their heads, Joaquin began talking about video hypnosis, which is a technique used to stop inhaling the nasty tobacco. The conversation drifts to Jimmy thanking Joaquin for being on the show, and Joaquin attempts to say something nice, but instead goes with, Yeah, it is what it is. Sips his coffee cup. The awkward laughing between these two is what made up a majority of the interview. That culminated in Jimmy telling Joaquin his name was too long to pronounce, and he replied by reminding Jimmy about the hundreds of people that he's met on the show and said, Hey man, I believe in ya. Number 4. Pete Davidson Pete made history as the youngest cast member on Saturday Night Live, but he's better known now as the guy who will steal your girl. In 2018, he made his late night debut sitting with the Batman star Robert Pattinson to discuss his engagement to Ariana Grande and his time on SNL. At one point, the conversation goes to Jimmy suggesting that the late night show stage may be the best place to get married. Davidson flipped the switch and asked, why so many people even cared about the situation? They weren't dating him, so there's no reason to like be involved in the wedding. He then told Jimmy how weird it was that Donald Trump was being arrested for sleeping with people. Meanwhile, the media wanted to know where they were having their wedding. Throughout the interview, Davidson swears over and over again, causing Jimmy to just jokingly fire him from the show. Luckily, the awkward exchange was not a real ban of any kind, and Davidson returned every time he's dated someone new. 27 times in 5 years. I'm just <laughs> kidding. It's 28. Number 3. Nicole Kidman In 2016, Nicole Kidman popped by the old couch and desk set to talk about her upcoming film, Lion. However, Jimmy had other ideas. From the moment that she enters the room, he laughs nervously. As the interview progresses, Jimmy shares that the pair had actually met before, to which Kidman said, <laughs> Oh, I remember. It turns out that Nicole had actually had a crush on Jimmy. Two years prior to the interview, Nicole actually attempted to go on a date with him, having a mutual friend set them up. But the late night show host blew his chance. According to Nicole, she showed up at his house where he just didn't talk to her and he played video games for an hour before she finally gave up and left. Jimmy claimed that he was unaware that this was an actual date, but judging by his actions, he probably thought it was a play date. His mom set up or something. Doesn't matter if you knew that or not, if Nicole Kidman knocks on your door, you pause the Fortnite, man. The overall interview was fairly uncomfortable, but this was a moment that truly made us cringe. Number two, Blake Shelton. Having someone look you in the eyes and sing to you is just so uncomfortable, especially on late night television. In 2017, Blake was on Jimmy's show to discuss his upcoming gig as the musical guest on Saturday Night Live. He kicks off the interview by heckling Blake over the cover of his 11th studio album, Texoma Shore. What started as lighthearted humor turned into full on roasting before Blake tries to move things along. He was there to talk about SNL, but before Jimmy gets a chance to discuss the soundtrack that he's gonna play, he sings a broken version of one of Blake's songs just right to his face. He even gets the audience to clap along while he butchers the lyrics. 
The entire time, which is a full minute, Blake looks extremely uncomfortable, just shaking his head and waiting for Jimmy to stop. When he finally does, Jimmy moves to a different topic, but the singer is visibly annoyed with not just the lack of knowledge for his lyrics, but the fact that Jimmy was singing in a hard cowboy accent. Eventually, Blake asks if Jimmy could just interview him already, finally getting things back on track. And at number one, Donald Trump. Donald Trump's interview with Jimmy Fallon will go down in the history books as the most awkward moment ever recorded. In 2016, while still campaigning for president, he appeared on The Tonight Show to discuss the future and his upcoming rally. Jimmy took advantage of the fact that Donald may be the president the next time that they spoke, asking if he could mess Donald's up hair while they're both still civilians. At first, Donald looks beyond annoyed, and like he may just snap at Jimmy right on camera. The audience roars with cheers though, which really seemed to shift his tone. He lets Jimmy ruffle his hair, only to reveal that he either got hair plugs or maybe he is just always wearing a wig. His hair looks like Jimmy Neutrons for a moment, a moment that went viral online. Despite him winning the election, this interview, and of course the photos that came from it, were the only thing on anyone's mind, and probably the only thing he's still remembered for now. Number 10, Jim Carrey. Jim is considered to be one of the funniest men in human history. In 1995 alone, he had three blockbuster comedies make it big at the box office, with Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, Dumb and Dumber, and The Mask. Now, as the years have gone by, his films were a roller coaster of genres. He slowly started moving into the realm of real with films like Yes Man and The Number 23, but that movie was really when people started to wonder if things were okay with Jim. And according to Jim himself, he was more than fine, he was learning. Jim has become a very introspective person as time has gone on, becoming more and more spiritual and sure of himself. He slowed down in the acting world and started painting, creating beautiful and disturbing pieces in his studio in New York, but the world of Hollywood was not letting him go so easy. Jim starred as Dr. Robotnik, aka Eggman, in the live action Sonic movie that gave Jim the modern day boost he needed to pop back into the mainstream. However, while being interviewed on the red carpet for Sonic 2, Jim explained that there were so many things over the years that he has been forced to ignore because of how busy he's been, joking that there was 25 years of mystery science theater to catch up on. He goes on to say that his paintings will soon be available as non-fungible tokens or NFTs, which is a word I did not think would ever come out of Jim Carrey's mouth. In recent interviews, Jim has been pretty adamant about quitting the acting world very soon, so it's looking more and more like Sonic 2 may be his last film role. Number 9, Billie Eilish. Billie is one of the best musicians around right now. You show anyone a picture of her or play even one second of Bad Guy, instant answer is Billie Eilish. While Billie has been making music for a long time, she hasn't always enjoyed the fame that comes with it. In 2020, she revealed that the pressure started really kicking in around 2016, having to deal with many things that would make most adults crumble. She was still a teen at the time, and having a massive crowd gathering around you every time you step outside is not fun. In an interview with the LA Times, she explained that she hated going outside, being recognized by anyone was panic inducing. She just wanted to do normal teenage things without being spotted by paparazzi. She then explained that being locked in her home in 2020 really helped her reflect on the situation and grow as a person. It's understandable that that pressure that young made her uncomfortable, like look how many child actors quit acting for the exact same reasons. That and a lot of DUIs. Number 8, Brad Pitt. In 2019, Brad sat down with Entertainment Tonight Canada to discuss the things that drive him to take the roles that he chooses. Pitt has been around since the mid-90s and has gone nowhere but up, up, and away. While he's not much of a franchise man, Pitt has been a busy bee starring in several blockbuster hits like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and so many more. Despite being a megastar, Brad has actually struggled with his fame over the years. He actually got very introspective in the interview, explaining that the struggle wasn't exactly with the glitz and glamour, but rather the distance that was growing between himself and everybody else. Else. He says that as he got older, the people he surrounded himself with became more and more important to him. He goes on to say that his time working on set meant that he would not be able to enjoy the things that he wished to use his money for, like traveling the world. Even though he has filmed in some pretty luxurious locations, actors rarely get enough time to actually enjoy the scenery. It seems that Brad's been able to get over his gripes, and he now leaves time for himself between shoots to get a little groovy. Number 7, Daniel Radcliffe. Dan the man with the plan can. Play Peter Pan, nailed it. 
Mr. Radcliffe of course rose to flame when he was just 12 years old, portraying the iconic magical misfit Harry Potter in the film series based on the novels by J.K. Rowling. Dan is one of the few child actors who continued to work following the end of their franchise, being in every genre imaginable, from dramatic art pieces like Swiss Army Man to the action thriller Guns Akimbo to the horror flick Woman in Black. Dan proved that he was more than a scar and some glasses. Of course, starting to be such a big name at such a young age had a massive effect on on Dan. Growing up in one of the most profitable franchises of all time, he would make regular appearances at conventions and in studios. Apparently, he faced a lot of hate from some fans who would actually boo him when he would walk on stage, something he claims to have been long lasting and anxiety fuel. Thankfully, the harsh words never stopped him from doing what he loved, appearing in eight Harry Potter movies before morphing into the Hollywood A lister that he is today. Number 6. Kylie Jenner Kylie is one of the younger members of the Kardashian clan. Being rich and famous at such a young age has dramatically impacted her day to day. In an interview from 2015, Jenner said that she woke up every morning with the worst anxiety, claiming to launch out of bed around 7 or 8 because she is nervous that there will be a negative article waiting for her to deal with. The fear is warranted as over the years her name has been on the front page of media outlets a few times for various scandals and rumors. Unfortunately, most of the things that have been revealed have been proven to be true, like the mistreatment of employees at her cosmetic factory or the fact that she lied to Forbes magazine about how rich she was, so kinda hard to feel bad for Kylie on this one. Number 5. Megan Fox one of two Transformers alumni that will pop up on this list, Megan Fox is one of the few people that hated acting so much that they did eventually retire. Megan was of course the hottest woman in Hollywood in the mid 2000s, but following her departure from the Transformers franchise, things started to take a turn. She was being casted in less and less, seemingly due to her bashing Hollywood any chance that she had. The reason she was let go from Transformers was because she referred to Michael Bay as a former leader of Germany whose name rhymes with Schmittler. Between 2012 and 2023, Megan only starred in one franchise, and that was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the live action series. So bad it was remade into an animated feature this year that made millions. Megan actually called out Hollywood a lot in the past, claiming the process behind developing a film and casting a project was disgusting. She felt like an object many times in her career, and rightfully so. Every shot of Megan during the day in Transformers looks like an Axe body spray commercial. While she is adamant that she absolutely hates being famous, she seems to be appearing in movies again, so I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe Hollywood likes it when their actor teases them. You know, it gives them a little tingle downstairs, a little kinky. Number 4. George Clooney George was a massive star in Hollywood, being deemed a Hollywood heartthrob thanks to his work on the hit TV series ER. Over the years, Clooney's career has been filled with many hits like Ocean's Eleven, as well as a brief stint as Batman in 1997 that I will never let him live down. In recent years, things have slowed down drastically for the heartthrob, being casted in less and less roles the closer we got to 2023. His last two roles were in The Flash and Ticket to Paradise with Julia Roberts, both of which received terrible box office returns. This may have something to do with George believing that Hollywood is an extremely toxic place. In an interview with IndieWire, Clooney said that fame can be very dangerous. While he has maintained a rather humble approach to life, that wasn't always the case. George recounted how early in his career he enjoyed the sneaky nature Nature of the press. He liked the fame being delivered to him on a daily basis, and it eventually messed with his mental health. Over the years, he's tried to separate himself from his projects once they wrapped up. These days, he spends a lot of time away from the spotlight, and instead being a full-time human just trying to exist. Number 3. Shia LaBeouf Shia is an interesting man. For a long time, he was Hollywood's go-to funny guy to throw into movies and TV shows, but since 2015, he's existed in this weird space between superstar and super jerk. Over the years, many situations involving Shia, including everything from shoving a dude to mistreating his ex, have been brought to light. This was part of the reason that he slowly started being casted in less and less projects, with his last big franchise being the third Transformers movie. Since then, he's had a slew of indie and passion projects, but according to Shia himself, the entire idea of Hollywood is, quote, soul crushing. During a Q&A at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2015, he claimed that there was little to no inclusivity in the industry, that he was a product for the studio to sell. He went off into a bit of a tangent that I won't quote fully because it will cause headaches. But to summarize in English that we can understand, Shia hated being famous for being someone's puppet and not for his own creative material. As we know, Shia never actually retired from acting 
interesting, but following this revelation, he has appeared in far more independent projects, which means he's given almost complete creative control as showcased in the 2019 award-winning film Honey Boy, loosely based on his own life. Number two, Robert Pattinson. Robert rose to fame thanks to playing the sparkling man with the plan Edward Cullen in the live-action Twilight series. While many are under the impression that being a part of such an iconic role would be a game-changer for most, for Robert, it was more of a waking nightmare. Sitting down for an interview in 2015, Rob gets real about the insanity that followed the release of Twilight. As one would expect, he was bombarded by fans in the streets constantly, and people were literally sitting outside of his house waiting for him to emerge, driving him crazy. He didn't go into supermarkets in person for six years, but these days he can actually exist in public since the Twilight stuff's kind of dying down. He was honest in the interview and expressed that he is one of the most uncomfortable people in his normal life, and that it took him a very, very long time to reach the level of comfort that he has now. All that fame of being an actor has little impact on him these days, as he's become a much more serious actor with films like The Batman and Tenant under his belt. Thankfully, the whole Twilight thing is over and done, but there is a prequel to The Hunger Games on its way in a couple months, so a uh, Twilight prequel? Anyone? Huh? You? Yes. Number one, Gigi Hadid. The Hadid modeling empire is strong, with Gigi being one of two Hadids roaming the runways of Paris. Despite coming from a wealthy family and living one of the most lavish lifestyles around, Gigi actually hates everything about it. According to herself, being busy for such long periods of times means that she isn't able to make time for the people who care about her in her life. She has lost a lot of friends over the years simply by being unavailable and everyone drifting apart. Now, this is a fair reason to hate your fame, but at the same time, if your friends can't respect that you're across the world modeling Chanel and Louis Vuitton, they don't deserve to be your friends. Besides, I've seen Gigi's Coca-Cola ad and she said she loves doing game night with her friends all the time. You're gonna tell me that was a lie? Name. Number 10, Macaulay Culkin. Having been in the acting industry since the age of four, Culkin was only nine when he starred in the first Home Alone movie and became a household name shortly afterwards. He was eventually named by VH1 in, 20, in 2005 as the second greatest child actor of all time. Culkin was also nominated for a Golden Globe for his appearance in the iconic Christmas film. And he also won that year's Young Artist Award for Best Young Actor in a Film Role. Like this dude, it was on an upward spiral. Culkin decided to leave the acting industry at the age of 14 in 19. Shortly after, he appeared as the lead in Donald Petrie's comedy film, Richie Rich. He took this step essentially because he felt tired of the industry and his parents' control over him. The Culkins do not have a great relationship with their father, Kit, who has eight children, two of whom are no longer with us. Macaulay, for instance, has spoken about how he was very physical towards them growing up. In a 2019 profile with Esquire, Macaulay portrayed his father as a controlling bully who pushed his sons into the acting business because he just couldn't achieve success for himself. He told many people in his life and later in interviews that acting had become a chore instead of something that he enjoyed doing. He wanted a normal childhood, so he quit and made it happen. Thankfully, he has since returned to the acting world, most notably in season 10 of the FX series American Horror Story, and he's married to former Disney star Brenda Sung. So things seem to work out in the end there. Number 9, Amanda Bynes. Amanda got her lucky break on the Nickelodeon sketch series, All That. Eventually, the producers decided to offer Amanda her own show. Her success only grew from there, and the Amanda Bynes show became one of Nickelodeon's Nickelodeon's most watched series, and she was picked up by several studios to star in non-Nickelodeon projects like She's the Man and Easy A. But Amanda took a hiatus in 2013 following a very public mental breakdown. According to Amanda, she had become addicted to the devil's lettuce at a young age, and while it wasn't an addiction at first, with more roles came more pressure and a need to find a new way to cope. This eventually led her to more drastic substances. In 2013, Amanda posted a series of bizarre tweets where she seemed to be insulting everybody that she could think of. She even called the former president Barack Obama's wife ugly, clearly referencing a character from The Amanda Show, but it's still pretty harsh. She was arrested and placed under psychiatric hold as she was accused of several hit and run incidents and was officially charged with reckless endangerment and criminal possession of herbs and spices. Her parents then placed her under a conservatorship until 2022 when she stood in front of a judge healthier and better than ever. Number 8, Kei Hoi Kwan. Kei Hoi Kwan is one of two goonies on this list, playing the character Data in the 1985 
5 classic. He was also short round in the Indiana Jones movies, delivering some iconic one-liners and cementing himself as a legend in the world of child acting. Around the end of 1991, he decided to take a break from the acting world as the fame and fortune was slowly becoming too stressful. He took a break from acting for over 20 years before making a triumphant return to the silver screen in 2022's Everything Everywhere All at Once as Waymond, the lovable universe jumping husband. In fact, he was so good in that role he received the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, delivering a tearful speech that I really can't talk about because I'm going to try to. Number 7. Lil Tay Lil Tay is a rapper and according to the photos that pop up when you google her, it looks like she has a phone made from $100 bills. I'm not sure what that's about. Recently she popped up in the news after someone shared the information that herself and her brother had passed away. This took the internet by storm and her fans were devastated. However, it turns out that she is still very much alive and in a statement given to TMZ from Tay's family, she made it perfectly clear that she is safe and still kicking and she said the last 24 hours had been particularly rough. Apparently her Instagram account was hacked by some third party and they used it to spread misinformation and just straight up rumors. But much like me, these guys didn't know how to spell stuff so the first clue was that her name was literally misprinted several times. What's still unclear is why it took Tay 24 hours to get word out that she was alive, especially because she says she was aware that her account was hacked and was getting phone calls about her passing. She got famous as being one of the world's youngest flexers, literally making money by pretending to have money on the internet. But she stopped doing that in 2018 after receiving so much online hate. And that's why many people were confused why her account had posted this announcement when it had been so inactive for so long. Number 6. Lindsay Lohan Lindsay is a jack of all trades. She acts, she sings, she dances, she writes, and she's even the queen of her own business empire. Now, despite all of this though, this former Disney star and Hollywood bad girl has a net worth of like $500,000. Well, that is apparently because she loves to take nice long vacations, like all of the time. Lohan has been forced to declare bankruptcy a few times, and as we know, she fell out of the mainstream and started a very public battle with substance control, basically quitting the acting world forever because she just got too into the partying lifestyle. This left Lindsay in the 600 figure range, making her poor by Hollywood standards. Eventually, this young child actor entered rehab and kicked their bad habits right into oncoming traffic. It wasn't until she posed for Playboy and opened up about her life on Oprah Winfrey's talk show that her finances began to stabilize, she started getting more roles again, so here's hoping that we get that Freaky Friday sequel we've all been waiting for. Number 5. Jeff Cohen Jeff's name may not be familiar to you, but his most iconic and only acting role certainly is. Jeff played Chunk in the much loved classic adventure flick The Goonies. Chunk was one of the many young actors in search of the treasure of one-eyed Willy, so they could save their small seaside neighborhood from being bulldozed to the ground. And this movie has aged like a fine wine. It just gets better and better the older you get. Jeff stole the show and truly stood out among the ensemble who, like who could forget his notorious interrogation scene? That dude almost got his hand blended. Following the success of the movie, many were under the impression that he was going to have a long, successful career. While his co-stars went to star in franchises like Lord of the Rings and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Jeff decided to go the opposite direction and he quit acting entirely. Unfortunately, he was being pegged as a chubby actor, so that's exactly what people were trying to cast him in. And rather than give him room to grow and breathe, studios were just trying to typecast him as this big nerdy dude in every single project. He found it difficult to secure work and it was unfortunately puberty that secured his fate. He was going from chunk to hunk, according to an interview with the Daily Mail, and eventually he realized that it just made sense to give up for now and try something else. So that is exactly what he did. He went to school, focused on his mental health, and he got a degree in law. And now he works out of a law firm that he co-founded with his business partner, Cohen Gardner. So good for you, Jeff. Number four, Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen. Mary Kate and Ashley were once the stars of their own show back in the day, and they made several movies together like Double Double, Toil and Trouble, and New York Minute. Now around 2005, these two suddenly stopped making movies or TV appearances out of the blue. It turns out that they had been fed up with the movie business. Not just that, but the amount of toxic men in the field really came to light. Apparently they were being harassed or mistreated all the time at a very young age. It's no wonder that they hated most of their time on set. Since stepping away from the movie industry, the twins launched a fashion brand called The Row, a company that has won several awards, even taking home the highest honor of the Council of Fashion Designers of America. Dude, that sounds like a fashion Illuminati to me. Probably some pretty comfy robes though. Number three, Barrett Oliver. The never ending story was a staple in many childhoods. Filled with magic and mystery, this film was dropped in our lives in 1984 and featured some of the most beautiful practical effects ever put to screen, and some really weird puppets. The main character 
character of the story is Bastion, a young man who finds a book about the world of Fantasia. Now we only see Barrett as the narrator a few times over the course of the film, but in the final act he is whisked into the world of Fantasia. Barrett starred in a handful of projects in the 1980s, but following 1985's Cocoon, Barrett decided to stop acting. The success of the film Never Ending Story was causing him trouble at school. Kids would be making fun of him and they actually called him Fur Boy. It was not fun. So he decided to quit acting and focused on another career. Oliver now works as a photographer and printer, specifically antique photos. So if you see a man with a long black beard and dreadlocks asking you for a photo on the boardwalk, it might be the kid from the never ending story. Number 2. Peter Ostrom From the moment he walked into the room, talent agents immediately knew that Peter was the perfect pick to play Charlie Buckets after seeing him partake in theater productions in Ohio. The young talent and his co-stars began filming in Munich in the summer of 1970 as he was approaching the 7th grade. The film was released in June 1971 and is still considered to be a classic in the world of cinema. It's personally been giving me joy and scaring the life out of me since I was a young lad. Following the success of the film, you'd think Peter would have continued to act, but instead he decided to step down and focus on his true passion, being a veterinarian. That's right, if you live in New York, there is a very good chance that Charlie frickin' Buckets had your cat spayed or neutered. In recent years, he has told interviewers and fans that the movie business just wasn't for him. Number 1. Jake Lloyd Jake was a little boy that became a Sith Lord, playing young Anakin Skywalker in Star Wars Episode 1. While his character eventually becomes Darth Vader, Lloyd's personal life would turn out to be mm, just as rough. Following the release of the film, Jake was actually picked on relentlessly by both his peers and Star Wars fans. He grew up with people hating him in public settings and cursing his name whenever Episode 1 was even mentioned. Seriously, Star Wars fans are just, just plain mean, man. Jake eventually decided to quit acting for good and save himself from any more public backlash. All that hate seemed to stick with Jake over the years though as he had become more and more violent in the public eye and he was becoming well known for being short tempered. In 2015, police chased the 26 year old Lloyd for 25 miles before he crashed off the side of a road on Interstate 95 in South Carolina. He wasn't intoxicated at the time but after being arrested and sent for a psychiatric evaluation, it was concluded that the young actor had just been suffering from schizophrenia and he was held for treatment. Thankfully, currently Jake is in a much better place mentally speaking, but his career will unfortunately never recover. Number 10, Jason Earls. Bang, flat it, Jackson! That, that's right, fans of the show surely recognize Mr. Jason Earls as Jackson Rod Stort, aka Miley's big brother. Fun fact, Jason was almost 30 years old when he started playing the character who's in his mid-teens, so hey, good for Jason for nabbing that one. He was a lovable goofball who always had something going on. This man was literally the physical embodiment of ADHD. I love him. Following his time on the show, he nabbed the role of Sensei Rudy Gillespie on the hit Disney XD series, Kicking It, which was genuinely one of my favorite sitcoms as a kid. The show centered around Rudy running the Bobby Wasabi Dojo, which was a failing karate studio and a strip mall. The show ran for four seasons before suddenly being cancelled in 2015. Jason was left wondering where his next check may come from and what his next job was going to be. Following kicking it, Jason ended up taking an unplanned hiatus from the acting world. A hiatus that finally ended in 2022 when he returned to the acting world in the Disney Plus show High School Musical The Musical The Series. Really Disney? You didn't want to workshop that one a little bit? Apparently though he's been involved with that show behind the scenes since it first aired as a mentor to the young actors. Jason is considered a Disney darling and he currently teaches the next generation how to be just as energetic as he was. Number 9. Shanika Knowles I know what you're thinking and no, despite sharing the same last name as Beyonce and Solange, Shanika is not related to the Knowles family. She just happens to share the same last name. That would be cool if everyone with the same last name was related though. There'd be so many Smiths. Shanika played Amber Addison, one half of the duo that would make up Miley's tormentors. Amber and Ashley made Miley's life a living hell on the show, with Amber being played as a jealous type. She thinks she's a great singer, she's the editor of the school yearbook, and she was the first in her class to get a driver's license. Oh, isn't that special? After the show was cancelled, it seems that Shanika probably should have told people that she was related to Beyonce. Unfortunately, her acting career never got bigger than her time on the show. During her time on the show, she was in the film Jump In alongside Corbin Blue, but even that was like a much smaller capacity. She was never able to find her place in Hollywood, and she now sits in that pile of actors that never moved on from the House of Mouse. Say hi to Mitchell Musso for us. Number 8. 
Mitchell Musso. Mitch played Hannah Montana's best friend Oliver Oaken on the hit Disney sitcom Hannah Montana. When the show was coming to an end, he began dominating the scene. He was being casted to voice people like Jeremy and Phineas and Ferb, and played one of the titular kings in Pair of Kings. And he was in something called Hatching Pete. I'm pretty sure I saw it, but I'm I like repressed that memory. It was really weird. He seemed to be following the same track as Demi Lovato as the next big thing to come from Disney. People think that about Demi Lovato, right? That's that's something that people agree on. Unfortunately, his career came to a screeching halt in 2011 when he was arrested in Burbank, California. He neglected to slow down after being directed by police, and the report said that the moment the window was rolled down, it was like a cloud of no-no juice just dropped kicked them in the nostrils. He blew a BLA of 0.8, which for those of you who don't know, means that he was hammied butt. He was arrested, forced to participate in a no-no juice educational program, and charged with driving under the influence. Needless to say, that didn't really go with Disney's vibe. So he was recasted on Pair of Kings, his prank show got cancelled, and he was basically blacklisted from Disney and everywhere else entirely. He had also been attempting to start a music career, but that just nosedived into a toilet. So if you'd like to find Mitchell these days, you can download one of his old songs, and you'll be the first one to do it in a while, so I'm sure he'll find you. Number seven, Moises Arias. Another former Hannah Montana star, Moises is probably best known as the young entrepreneur and biggest troublemaker on the beach, Rico. His character the character on the show was always getting sucked into the family's problems, and he delivered some iconic moments that are a big part of the reason that this show still holds up. There's a good chance that you've seen him in recent Hollywood flicks, but you might not realize who he was. Since leaving the Disney world behind, Arias has been a part of several indie films that received stellar reviews like the coming of age story Kings of Summer when he played Biagio, but most recently he starred alongside SNL alumni Davidson in a movie based on the comedian's early life called King of Staten Island, sprouting a go and he's got tattoos all over him, he's unrecognizable. It must be in his contract that he exclusively works in films with King in the title though, it's just a little coincidental. Number 6, Sterling Knight. Sterling only made a handful of appearances on the show, but certainly made his mark as one of Hannah Montana's love interests that doesn't exactly work out. Hannah Montana was actually just one of a few shows that Sterling ended up being a part of, being casted in stuff like Sunny with a Chance, So Random, and Starstruck. His most lucrative role though was playing Zac Efron's son in the film 17 again. That's right, I bet you forgot about that one. Weird movie, guys. Since his days at Disney, he has unfortunately fallen into the category of brokest cast member. He's made small cameo appearances in films and TV over the years, but he hasn't had a significant acting gig since 2015. Nowadays, he's still trying to work, but when he's not working, he enjoys traveling across the globe. I'm not sure that's a great way to save money, but eh, I'm terrible with my finances, so who am I to judge? Number five, Cody Lindley. Cody was probably the most memorable love interest to ever appear on the sitcom. Sorry, Jesse McCartney. McCartney, not today. Cody played Miley's on and off again love interest Jake Ryan, returning over and over again until the show's final season. If you were a fan of Jake, then I have good news. If you hated Jake, I have bad news. It actually took a few years for him to stop acting following his time on Hannah Montana. He was able to snag a role in the Sharknado franchise, specifically 4 and 5. There are 7 of those movies. Whoever keeps doing that, please stop. Outside of his role on Sharknado, he's unfortunately found it difficult to find work. Apparently being a Disney kid can severely hurt your career, cause during his time on the show, he was in a ton of projects, either produced or developed by Disney, but the moment that the show was over, it was like he got Do Not Hire just stamped on his forehead. Which is a shame, cause I saw some of the clips from Sharknado and it's surprisingly entertaining. Number 4. Emily Osmond. Many fans of the show may believe Emily Osmond got her start on the Disney sitcom, but she was actually a well-established actor well before that, starring as Gertie Giggles in the Spy Kids franchise. Remember those movies? I swear the pitch for that was just like, hey kid in Jackpack goes wee! She fell more into the mainstream though, thanks to her role as Hannah Montana's best friend in the world, Lily Truscott. The reason Emily is so far down on this list is because she is one of the few Hannah Montana stars who's still working to this day. That's right. I could not find 10 broke people to use for this list from the show because everyone was just so good at their jobs that they ended up doing stuff afterwards. Emily starred in sitcom after sitcom, even being the lead of her own between 2014 and 2018 called Young and Hungry. Emily currently spends her time, that's right, still on camera, and most recently she played a character named Chelsea on the sitcom Pretty Smart. While she may still only be in the world of TV, she seems to have found a nice home among the lights and cameras. Heck, she probably stays there where she films. I don't no, that bed on Young and Hungry did look pretty comfy. Free rent. Number three, Billy Ray Cyrus. Billy Ray Cyrus. 
What a great name. It's three first names all in one, so you know that this guy is a country singer. Billy Ray is not only the fictional father of Hannah Montana, but he's actually her real life papa too. Billy Ray, and I do have to say that, not Billy. Billy Ray was a welcome addition to the cast of characters that made up Hannah's life. Being a silly but grounded father figure who actually had a lot of wisdom to share with the young fans. Following the show's cancellation, Billy made the decision to focus on his music career instead of acting. Like he appeared in a few movies here and there, but it was really his voice that got him back into the mainstream. Thanks to his vocal track on the song Old Town Road, as well as his appearance in the music video, you can find any and all songs from this man on Spotify, and good lord I recommend you do so and blast it as loud as you can. Good old Billy Ray. Number two, Dolly Parton. She tumbled out of bed and stumbled in the kitchen when she played the role of Hannah Montana's Aunt Dolly on the sitcom. First of all, this woman is in no way broke. She is a sweetheart with a theme park that is one of my personal favorites. It's jammed against the side of a mountain and it's in Tennessee, so nice. She made this list because she was on the show, she's worth mentioning, and to be honest, I ran out of unsuccessful people from the show to use. Everyone did really well in the world of acting. Now, we gotta mention Miss Parton because A, iconic character on the show, and B, cause I wanna! Her role as Miley's aunt on the show was incredibly well done. Despite Dolly basically playing herself, her character was often there to help Miley in times of struggle. And she delivered a lot of words of wisdom that not only helped her character, but that spread a really positive message to the audience as well. In the past few years, Dolly has been very active in the music world and has even ventured into the world of writing, releasing her first book called Run Rose Run, that she co-wrote with James Patterson. She also released an album to go along with that book just as a little bonus. If you're lucky enough to spot her, she does apparently spend some of her personal time at that theme park, but she's not hidden on a ride like Johnny Depp, who I swear is there all the time. That thing looks way too real. And at number one, Miley Cyrus. Taking the top spot on this list is Miley Cyrus because she is still the most famous cast member to ever come out of this sitcom. Starring, of course, as the titular Hannah Montana, Miley doubled as an actor and a musician. I can still hear the climb ringing in my skull any time I walk up a hill. Her epic voice and talents as an actor nabbed her a sitcom that lasted over five years. But when the show was done, fans wanted to know where Miley was going next. Well, that question was answered in 2013 when she decided to show the world that she was no longer some goody two-shoes Disney girl. She was now a woman with her own free will, and she used that free will to swing on a wrecking ball in her birthday suit. And she started one of the most popular dance moves of the 21st century. And I, I still can't do it. Like, is it in the hips? What is I? Following the end of the series, she focused on her music career and stuck to it for quite some time. I'm not saying that she doesn't sing anymore, in fact, she pumps out fresh tracks all the time. When it comes to the acting world, she's actually played herself in films and TV more often than anything. Sure, she's had some voiceover roles in movies like Bolt or Guardians of the Galaxy, yeah, that happened. But in films like The Night Before, Pop Star Never Stopping, she's just like a fictionalized, wilder version of herself. Who knows what she may pop in next? Got any theories? Let us know in the comments below. Those are the Hannah Montana stars that lost their fame overnight. If you were upset that most of these people turned out okay, I'm sorry, it's not my fault. I was seven when this thing came out. It's not like I could have influenced the decision process. I'm not the boss, baby. All right, number 10, Drake Bell, uh, Drake and Josh, a sitcom that gifted us with some incredible one-liners and caused anyone named Megan to have their lives changed forever. Drake Bell and Josh Peck starred as the titular Drake and Josh for four seasons before being canceled in 2008. Following the cancellation, the three main cast members, they all went on to have steady work for a short while. Miranda Cosgrove, who played Megan, had some success in voiceover and was given her own series, iCarly, before dropping out of the acting world in 2015. Josh Peck starred in a few movies and TV shows here and there, but has only recently made a return to mainstream, appearing in the new Christopher Nolan film Oppenheimer. Drake has probably had the worst go of the crew when the show was canceled. His his roles were limited to straight to video flicks and voiceovers starring as Spider-Man in the animated Ultimate Spider-Man series. The worst performance of all though was when Nickelodeon thought it would be a great idea to make a live action Fairly Odd Parents movie, I actually remember this, starring Drake as Timmy Turner. Needless to say his status as a celebrity was gone at that point, but the nail was driven into the coffin in 2021 when Drake was sentenced to two years of probation and 200 hours of community service after it was revealed he'd been being a young fan for years. So if you see him in an orange jumpsuit cleaning graffiti off the wall, you'll know why. 
All right, Jamie Lynn Spears at our number nine spot. Jamie starred as the title character Zoe in the hit series Zoe 101 alongside fellow entry on this list, Matthew Underwood. Her time on the show was well received and made many fans excited about what she may film next. When the show was eventually canceled in 2008, Jamie was at the center of a massive media rumor. The theory was that Zoe 101 was abruptly canceled due to Jamie becoming pregnant with her daughter. The reality was that never happened. Jamie did get pregnant, but it was six months after filming had wrapped on the series. So the show was canceled by the executives at Nickelodeon. For some reason, they felt the show was done and needed to be replaced by something new and more fun. And Jamie actually did have plans to continue her career on the silver screen. But like we said, six months into looking for work, a new job opportunity opened up and it would be the most challenging of all, the role of a mother. She decided to move back to Mississippi and gave up her career in film to raise her kid and be a star to, you know, the household. Now it's not all missed opportunities, however, as Jamie is still remembered fondly as a musician, releasing several songs before 2010, and has recently been popping up at several country and rock festivals to lend her voice to the crowd, and many fans will be happy to know that not only there will be a Zoe 101 flick released on Paramount Plus this fall, but it stars the entire original cast, and a trailer is already out for us to enjoy. Perfect. All right, number eight, Jake Paul. Jake Paul looted them all. News headline or Dr. Seuss title, I don't know, that's right. The famous YouTuber Jake Paul was briefly a Disney star in the early 2010s, appearing on a short-lived sitcom called Bizarre Bark. And in 2020, Paul was involved in a looting that took place in Scottsdale, Arizona. A riot broke out in a mall, literally surrounded by police helicopters with lights and sirens. And Jake's reaction had people scrambling for their phones and cameras, but video footage was released by Paul himself showcasing the events of the night. People were smashing windows and taking everything in sight. And while Paul posted a statement on Twitter claiming he had nothing to do with the riots and they were exclusively kind of observers of the event. But the video did show Jake intervening with looters in the mall. And of course, groups were recognizing him almost immediately. And thankfully, the authorities stepped in to make their move on Jake, who told his fans, no cap, that's tear gas, bro. Okay. Thank you. However, that was just the situation Disney needed to kind of finally fire the guy according to Disney and his reckless public behavior was very well known to them at the time. And there had been plans in place to simply address the issue and learn. But the following events in Scottsdale, well, kind of had no choice to cut ties with the performer immediately. He was charged with criminal trespassing and his defense for the Scottsdale event was that he was documenting it as a quote, public service. If I videotape my friend stealing a Star Wars mug from Hot Topic, is that also a public service? I don't know. All right, number seven, Mitchell Musso. Mitch played Hannah Montana's best friend, Oliver Oaken, on the hit Disney sitcom, Hannah Montana. When the show was coming to an end, he began dominating the Disney scene. He was cast to voice Jeremy and Phineas and Ferb, playing one of the Ritual Kings and Pair of Kings, and something called Hatching Pete, which I vaguely remember watching, but this one I'm pretty sure I've kind of repressed. Now, he seems to be on track to follow Demi Lovato as the next big thing to come from Disney, and people think that about Demi Lovato, right? Fortunately, his career came to a screeching halt in 2011 when he was arrested in Burbank, California. He neglected to slow down after being directed to kind of do so by police and pull over. The report said the moment the window was rolled down, it was like a cloud of something just drop kicked them in the nostrils and he blew a BAL of 0.8, which for those who don't know means he was kind of gone. He was also forced to participate in a adult juice educational program and charged with driving under the influence. Kind of standard, but needless to say, it doesn't really go with Disney's vibe. So he was recast on Pair of Kings. His prank show, it was canceled. And he was basically blacklisted from Disney entirely. He had also been attempting to start a music career, but that also just kind of nose dived into the toilet. Now, if you'd like to find Mitchell these days, just go download one of his old songs. You'll be the first to do in a while, and I'm sure Sure, he'll find you. All right, at number six, we have Orlando Brown. That's So Raven, another series considered to be a part of the golden years, also known as the early 2000s of Disney, starred Raven Simone as the titular character who had the ability to briefly see the future via unprompted visions. I swear every time I explain a plot to an old Disney show, I question who was on what when they were pitched. The show had a stellar supporting cast, including Raven's best friend, Chelsea and Eddie, played by Annalise Vanderpaul and Orlando 
program. Orlando's time as Eddie was received well with audiences, and he quickly became a fan favorite for not only his comedic abilities, but dramatic ability as well. Now, after Raven wrapped up its final season, Orlando's career, it took a bit of a turn. Surprisingly, he was being cast as a small side character or secondary characters with minimal screen time. So he never really got a lead after the show. In 2022, he appeared on Dr. Phil's talk show and opened up about his struggles mentally and financially. He also shocked audiences with his new look, drenched in tattoos and sporting a pair of demon eye contacts. Now, unfortunately, it seems that Orlando has fallen victim to the darker side of Disney and he was arrested for a misdemeanor as well after an altercation with his brother. All right, number five, Brenda Song. London Tipton, she was the daughter of the man behind the chains of Tipton Hotels in the sitcom Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Brenda Song accepted the role right as she was about to start college. Little did she know the character would consume her life for the next six years. She appeared as London on both Zack and Cody and its reboot sequel, The Sweet Life on Deck, for a total of six seasons following the show's cancellation in 2011. Brenda starred in a few smaller roles and films like The Social Network, as well as TV shows in like Scandal. Uh, New Girl and Superstore. Now Brenda, she's still active in the acting community, just in smaller, just in a smaller capacity as she's traded in her Disney fame for family fortune, starting a family with her boyfriend and fellow child star, Macaulay Culkin. Now Richie Rich and London Tipton have a child together and that's not a show or not even a reality show. Brenda is slowly making her return to the mainstream as well. However, she has recently starred in a few Netflix and Hulu series, including the comedy series Dollface, where Brenda claims to have rediscovered her passion for acting. And here's hoping that inspires Disney to make another Wendy Wu movie, maybe? If you don't know Wendy Wu, Homecoming Warrior, you, you need to look into that. <laughs> All right, number four, Kel Mitchell. Welcome to Good Burger, home of Good Burger. Can I take your order? The sentence that always blasts into my skull when I talk about Kel Mitchell. Kel was another young buck to be cast on the hit show, All That, with Amanda Bynes and future best friend, Kenan Thompson. Much like Amanda, Kel was asked to participate in a spinoff of All That, only this time a straight up sitcom rather than more of a sketch show. And the show, Kenan and Kel, starring Kel and Kenan Thompson, is one of my favorite that Disney Channel produced. And these two had incredible chemistry and so good that Nickelodeon had a movie centered around them, Good Burger, that has actually aged pretty well. And his character never really took off after that, with him only appearing in that sitcom world and in a minimal capacity then. But his loss of fame was kind of self-inflicted as his career on screen slowed down. His family life has been nothing but up. He decided to stay at home and focused on building a relationship with his wife and rapper Asia Lee. And they are currently expecting a second child sometime this year. We're hoping that when the kids are a little older, Kel can get some time off and maybe make a return to the acting world. There was a rumor of a Good Burger 2 being in the works, so let's start that now. Hashtag Good Burger 2, make it a trend. <laughs> All right, number three, Josh Peck. Josh made up the second half of the series Drake and Josh alongside musician and bad boy Drake Bell. Josh got his start on the Amanda Bynes show alongside Amanda Bynes, participating in several classic sketches before eventually moving on to his own sitcom that is still considered to be one of the best Nickelodeon shows ever produced. Josh's time on the show, it was wonderful. He delivered a zany, big hearted kind of brother vibe that went really well with Drake's rock and roll, I need love on the inside. Um, kind of character and following the cancellation of the show, Josh went on to star in several silver screen showings like the underrated comedy Drill Bit Taylor starring Owen Wilson and the reboot of Red Dawn from 2012 alongside Chris Hemsworth. His career dipped in quality following that performance though. Josh was starting to seem like another Nickelodeon kid who was growing up to be rambunctious and wild instead of taking his job seriously. He lended his voice though to several characters over the years, including various roles in the Ice Age films, but has mainly stuck to small TV roles or independent flicks and he did maintain a following. However, as of a few years ago, he started posting TikToks as well. Those received millions of views. And recently Josh has popped up on the cast list of Christopher Nolan's upcoming historical drama Oppenheimer. Perhaps this will mark his return to the acting world if it's in a movie like that. Now, he may be on the road to Oscar territory. All right, number two, Amanda Bynes. Amanda, she got her lucky break on the Nickelodeon sketch series, All That, essentially the Nickelodeon version of late night sketch show Saturday Night Live. It sported a stellar cast, including current SNL cast member Kenan Thompson, 
Drake Bell and Lori Beth Denberg. Eventually, the producer decided to offer Amanda her own series. Her success only grew from there. The Amanda Bynes Show became one of Nickelodeon's most watched series, and she was picked up by several studios to star in non-Nickelodeon projects like She's the Man, Easy A, and Amanda took a hiatus, however, in 2013 following a very public breakdown. In 2018, she told fans exactly what caused this breakdown. Now, according to Amanda, she became addicted to the devil's lettuce at a young age. While it wasn't an addiction at first, more roles came more pressure and a kind of way to cope. And this eventually led her to more drastic substances. She also believed that she wasn't pretty enough anymore to be in films. And she took Adderall as a way to help her stay thin. In 2013, Amanda posted a series of bizarre tweets where she seemed to be insulting almost everyone she could think of. She called the former president Barack Obama ugly, clearly referring a character from the Amanda show, but still. She was arrested and placed under psychiatric hold as she was accused of several hit and run incidents. And was officially charged with reckless endangerment and criminal possession of some interesting herbs and spices. Her parents then placed her under a conservatorship until 2022 when she stood in front of a judge, healthier and better than ever, ready to move on with her life. The judge then said, okay, Amanda is free to go. Good luck, Amanda, then. Hey, there's a million kids who grew up with you and we've got your back. All right, let's end things off with number one, Lindsay Lohan. Lindsay is a Disney star who actually never really appeared in a sitcom or TV series. She got her start acting at just the age of three, starring in over 60 TV spots and commercials for brands like Gap, Pizza Hut, and Jell-O. She got her big break when Disney cast her to play two roles in the classic Disney family comedy, The Parent Trap. She played twin sisters, Hallie Parker and Annie James, who randomly met at a summer camp and discover their parents split up when they were babies following a divorce. The twins then hatch a plot to get mom and dad back together and it's delightful, one of my favorites. Her career though only seemed to rise from there, starring in several cult classics like Freaky Friday with Jamie Lee Curtis and Mean Girls as the main character, Katie Heron. Unfortunately, her career took a step in the wrong direction when she was arrested in 2007 for driving under the influence of a controlled substance for which she served 84 minutes in jail. Yep, minutes. Some people spent years in jail. Lindsay, she got a warning there. Until 2022, her career um, kind of came to an abrupt standstill, but she not only seems to be better mentally, um, she's also under contract with the streaming giant Netflix to release a few rom-com flicks over the next couple years. So maybe her and Adam Sandler will make a Netflix multiverse. Now, I don't know how I'd feel about that, but We'll see where it goes. Number 10, Kel Mitchell. Welcome to Good Burger, home of the Good Burger. Can I take your order? That sentence always blasts into my skull when I talk about Kel Mitchell, and I really hope it's the same for you. Kel was another young buck to be casted on the hit sketch show, All That, with Amanda Bynes and future best friend, Kenan Thompson. Much like Amanda, Kel was asked to participate in a spin-off of All That, only this time he was in a straight up sitcom rather than a sketch show. The show Kenan and Kel, starring Kel and Kenan Thompson, it's one of my favorite shows that was ever produced by the Nickelodeon channel. These two had incredible chemistry. So good that Nick backed a movie centered around their Good Burger sketch that has actually aged pretty well. His career never really took off after that, with him only appearing in the sitcom world and in a minimal capacity at that. But his loss of fame was self-inflicted. As his career on the screen slowed down, his family life had been nothing but going up. He decided to stay at home and focus on building a relationship with his wife and rapper, Asia Lee, and they are currently expecting a second child together sometime time this year. Here's hoping that when the kids are all a little older that Kel can finally take some time off and make a return to the acting world for good. There was a rumor of a Good Burger 2 being in the works, so I don't know, let's start that now. Everybody, hashtag Good Burger 2, make that trend. Number 9, Miranda Cosgrove. Miranda may have rose to Nickelodeon stardom when she played the titular Carly on the show iCarly, but she got her first big role starring alongside Jack Black in the classic comedy School of Rock. During her time with Nickelodeon, she not only played Carly, but she also played the mischievous little sister, Megan, in the sitcom Drake and Josh. There's a neat little fan theory about that, but I won't get into it right now. Following the end of iCarly, Miranda seemed to disappear from the world of acting entirely, apart from lending her voice to the character Margot in the Despicable Me franchise. The reason being is she decided to go back to school. She used her iCarly cash to fund a degree at the University of Southern California, where she initially took film studies, but eventually shifted her focus to a major in psychology. She put her talents on pause, but following her graduation, and her recent return to sitcom world, iCarly was revived for Paramount Plus last year. She's still not famous per se, but it is cool to see Miranda on screen again after so many years
years away. Number eight, Drake Bell. Ah, Drake and Josh. A sitcom that gifted us with some incredible one-liners and caused anyone named Megan to have their name screeched in their face in frustration. Megan! Drake Bell and Josh Peck starred as the titular Drake and Josh for four seasons before being cancelled in 2008. Following the cancellation, the three main cast members all went on to have semi-steady work. For a short while at least. Miranda Cosgrove, who we just talked about, played Megan and had some success in voiceovers, but she got her own sitcom and then dropped out of the acting world in 2015. Josh Peck starred in a few movies and TV shows here and there, but he's only recently made a return to the mainstream, appearing in the new Christopher Nolan film Oppenheimer. Drake has probably had the worst go of the crew. When the show was cancelled, his roles were limited to straight to video flicks and voiceover starring, and voiceover roles, starring as Spider Man in the animated Ultimate Spider Man series. The worst performance of all, though, was when Nickelodeon thought that it would be a great idea to make a live action, fairly odd parents movie starring Drake as. Timmy Turner. Fairies! Needless to say, his status as a celebrity was gone at that point, but the nail was driven into the coffin in 2021 when Drake was sentenced to two years of probation and 200 hours of community service after it was revealed that he had been grooming a young fan for years. So if you see him in an orange jumpsuit on the side of the road or like cleaning graffiti off a wall, now you know why. Number seven, Amanda Bynes. Amanda got her lucky break on the Nickelodeon sketch series All That, which was essentially Nickelodeon's version of the late night sketch show Saturday Night Live. It sported a stellar cast, including current SNL cast member Kenan Thompson, Drake Bell, and Lori Beth Denberg. Eventually, the producer decided to offer Amanda her own series. Her success only grew from there. The Amanda Bynes show became one of Nickelodeon's most watched series, and she was picked up by several studios to star in non-Nickelodeon projects like She's the Man and Easy A. Amanda took a hiatus, however, in 2013 following a very public mental breakdown. In 2018, she told fans exactly what caused that breakdown. According to Amanda, she became addicted to the devil's lettuce at a very young age, and while it wasn't an addiction at first, with more roles came more pressure, and a need to find a new way to cope. This eventually led her to more drastic substances. She also believed that she wasn't pretty enough anymore to be in films, even taking Adderall as a way to help keep her skinny. In 2018, in 2013, Amanda posted a series of bizarre tweets where she seemed to be insulting almost everyone that she could think of. Like she called the former president Barack Obama ugly. Like she's clearly referencing a character from the Amanda show, but still. She was arrested and placed under psychiatric hold as she was accused of several hit and run incidents and was officially charged with reckless endangerment and criminal possession of herbs and spices. Her parents then placed her under a conservatorship until 2022 when she stood in front of a judge, held Healthier and better than ever, and ready to move on with her life. The judge said, okay, and Amanda is now free to live. So good luck, Amanda. There's a million kids who grew up with you, and we've all got your back. Number six, Dan Schneider. Dan was never a star on camera other than a small role in the movie Good Burger, but without this man, we may not have a lot of beloved TV shows. Dan was a producer behind some of the biggest shows Nickelodeon had to offer. Shows like Keenan and Kel, Drake and Josh, iCarly, Zoe 101, all classics that may have never been set to film without Dan at the helm. While Dan was producing well into the late 2010s, his career abruptly ended in 2018. 18, when allegations were brought to light, alleging that Dan's behavior over the years was anything but wholesome. According to several set and cast members who've worked with Dan in the past, Dan has a massive temper that would regularly disrupt shoots, he's caused production delays on his own, ballooned the budgets of all of his shows, and there were several complaints about his verbal insults. Reportedly emailing and texting cast and crew to complain about things during off hours. Like, hey man, I'm trying to watch Too Hot to Handle, can we just save this till tomorrow? The worst of them all, and what really got him fired was the way that he was towards his younger cast. I won't go too far into detail because I would probably vomit on camera if I did, but let's just say that Dan is creepy creep who likes dem feet. Put it that way. Thankfully, he's been fired and will never make another penny off of that channel ever again. Number five, Devin Werkheiser. You may not know Devin by his name, but his face certainly rings a middle school bell in your skull. Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide first premiered in September 2004. For those who missed out on this gem, it followed the titular Ned as he guided us through the daily struggles of attending middle school. It was an instant hit, and I personally watched every episode that they ever made. I basically grew up with this guy. After three seasons of the show, it was cancelled, leaving its cast to fend for themselves and find new work. Most of the younger cast members 
members on the show decided to step away from the acting world, with Lindsay Shaw, who played Moe's, being the only one with steady work, albeit in like low budget films, but still, it's work. And she's been doing that ever since the show ended. Now, Devin could have had a stellar career, but he said in recent years that following the end of the show, he just had no idea what he was supposed to do next. Devin was 15 when the show finished, and between then and the age of 25, he said he never really found his footing as an actor, always being called back for things, but never actually hired. In his mid-20s, the residuals from Ned's finally ran out, forcing him to take his first ever 9 to 5 job. This was the wake-up call that he needed though, as he was finally motivated to do more. And thanks to many fans who were now adults, DMing him and asking him when the next Ned's College or Adult Guide would be released. Well, Devin has begun doing a series of lectures across the United States, in college and university campuses, in an attempt to give advice on the wild world of adulthood. He's also begun a podcast with his co-stars, Lindsay Shaw and Daniel Curtis Lee, who played Moe's and Cookie, where the three break down behind the scenes facts about every episode of the show. So if you want a little bit of Ned's declassified nostalgia, then check that out. Number four, Matthew Underwood. Matthew played the rich boy with the puka necklace, Logan on the hit series, Zoe 101. The show followed the titular Zoe as she started her life at a new private boarding school, where wild and wacky situations ensue. The show gifted us some highly quotable lines and memorable moments that have surely stuck in your head since the show's cancellation in 2008. Matthew played a mean jock on the show, but his character had a lovable side that quickly won fans over. When the show ended, his life started going down a dark path. He found himself involved in some legal troubles after being caught in possession of a controlled substance, devil's lettuce, for which he received 12 months probation. He violated that probation when he entered a hookah bar, which he co-owned, in St. Lucille called Cloud Nine. His criminal history was brief, but it was enough to get him blacklisted from the acting world. There is a nice ending to this story, however. After laying low and working on his mental health, Matthew actually ended up rescuing a baby from a crashed car, along with both parents who had allegedly over on warm needle juice. This act not only saved the baby, but a judge ruled that the parents were unfit and the child was given to a family member and they're living happily ever after thanks to Logan. Matt is currently working behind the screen as a director on short films and indie projects, so hey, if you see that Zoe 101 reboot in the future, he's ready to go. Number three, Jamie Lynn Spears. Continuing on the Zoe 101 train for a minute, Jamie starred as the titular Zoe in the hit series, Zoe 101, alongside fellow entry on this list, Matthew Underwood. Her time on the show was well received and made many fans excited about what she may film next. When the show was eventually cancelled in 2008, Jamie was at the center of a massive media rumor. The theory was that Zoe 101 was abruptly cancelled due to Jamie becoming pregnant with her daughter. The reality was that that never happened. Jamie did get pregnant, but it was like six months after filming had wrapped on the series. The show was cancelled by the executives at Nickelodeon. For some reason, they felt that the show was done and just needed to replace it with something new and more colorful. Jamie Amy actually did have plans to continue her career on the silver screen, but like we said, six months into looking for a new work, a new job opportunity opened up, and it would be the most challenging job of all the role of being a mom. She decided to move back to Mississippi and give up a career in film to raise her kid and be a star to her. It's not all missed opportunities, however, as Jamie is still remembered fondly as a musician, releasing several songs before 2010, and she's recently been popping up at several country and rock festivals to lend her voice to the crowd. Many fans will be happy to know that not only will there be a Zoe 101 flick released on Paramount Plus this fall, but it stars the entire original cast, and there's a trailer already out for us to enjoy. Number two, Josh Peck. Josh made up the second half of the series Drake and Josh alongside musician and bad boy Drake Bell. Josh got his start on the Amanda Bynes show alongside Amanda Bynes, participating in several classic sketches before eventually moving into his own sitcom. Still considered to be one of the best shows that Nickelodeon ever produced. Josh's time on the show was wonderful. He delivered a zany, big hearted brother vibe that went really well with Drake's rock and roll, I need love inside attitude. Following the cancellation of the show, Josh went on to star in several silver screen darlings like the underrated comedy Drillbit Taylor alongside Owen Wilson and the reboot of Red Dawn from 2012 alongside Chris Hemsworth. His career dipped in quality following that performance, however. Josh was starting to seem like another one of those Nickelodeon kids who was growing up to be a rambunctious and wild man instead of actually taking his job seriously. He lended his voice to several characters over the years, including various roles in the Ice Age films, but he's mainly stuck to small TV roles or indie flicks. He did did maintain a following, however.
however, as a few years ago he started posting TikToks that received millions of views. But recently, Josh has popped up on the cast list for Christopher Nolan's upcoming historical drama Oppenheimer, so perhaps this will mark his return to the acting world, and if it's in a flick like this, well, he might be on the road to Oscar territory. And at number one, Nat Wolf. Nat Wolf and his brother Alex were the stars of the short lived Nickelodeon series The Naked Brothers Band that premiered in 2007 following the success of the original Nickelodeon movie of the same name. When the show ended, Nat decided to move on from the screen, from the on screen world, and focus on his career in music with his brother Alex. He did, however, make a handful of appearances in romantic dramedies like Paper Towns and Fault in Our Stars. Unfortunately, he took a role that he probably shouldn't have in 2017 when he played the character. Light in the Netflix live action adaptation of the anime series Death Note. In case you didn't know, the anime originated in Japan and stars Japanese voice actors. There is not a single actor of Japanese origin in the live action flick, and Nat's performance was seen as nothing more than another example of Hollywood whitewashing for streaming services. He received a large amount of backlash from fans of the show and dropped out of the acting scene overnight. It wasn't until this past year that he reappeared on the small screen. Nat has been cast to play the love interest to Joe Exotic, Trevor, in the Peacock series Joe vs. Carol, a show based on the popular Netflix docuseries Tiger King. While that show hasn't really garnered the popularity that it really should, seeing Nat make a return to the scene is awesome. And as a fan of his show back in the day, I am hoping he collaborates with Alex for a horror film. After seeing Alex star in the 2017 horror pick Hereditary, it's like the only thing I can think about when I see these two. Number 10, Brenda Song. London Tipton was the daughter of the man behind the chain of Tipton Hotels in the sitcom Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Brenda Song accepted the role right as she was about to start college. Little did she know that that character would consume her life for the next six years. She appeared as London on both Zack and Cody and its reboot sequel series Sweet Life on Deck for a total of six seasons. Following the show's cancellation in 2011, Brenda starred in a few smaller roles in films like The Social Network, as well as TV roles in shows like Scandal, New Girl, and Superstore. Brenda is still active in the acting community, just in a smaller capacity, as she's traded in her Disney fame for family fortune, starting a family with her boyfriend and fellow child star Macaulay Culkin. Dude, Richie Rich and London Tipton have a child together and that's not a TV show? Brenda is slowly making her return to the mainstream, however, as she's recently starred in a few Netflix and Hulu series, including the comedy series Dollface, where Brenda claims to have rediscovered her passion for acting. Here's hoping this inspires Disney to make another Wendy Wu movie. And if you don't know Wendy Wu Homecoming Warrior, well, that, that's fair. Number 9, Shia LaBeouf. Shia has been a controversial celebrity over the years, becoming famous as one of the hardest people to work with in Hollywood history. Like many bad apples in LA, Shia got his start on the Disney Channel. At the turn of the century, Disney released a little show called The Even Stevens. The series followed the titular Stevens family with a focus on the kids, Ren and Lewis, played by Christy Romano and Shia LaBeouf. The show is considered to be one of Disney's best, spanning three seasons and spawning an Even Stevens movie that is one of the greatest pieces of cinema ever released. These days, Shia has adopted a more mountain man look, always sprouting like a big bushy beard when he can. And he's gone from bright and youthful to just tired and annoyed. And we feel that, Shia. We really feel that. Following the show's end, Shia kept his acting career going strong, appearing in the much-loved classic Holes as main character Stanley Yelnats. But it wasn't until his casting in the live-action Transformers series that he really began to descend into madness. Since 2007, Shia's behavior as both an actor and a person have been getting worse and worse. His fellow actors have reported that Shia takes method acting way too far and just smells terrible on set, not to mention the several public art displays that he gifted the world in the mid-2010s. Oh, and who could forget his passionate, motivational video where he just told us that nothing was impossible and just do it! While he may still be working today, his reputation as a celebrity has certainly shifted from A-list to the Nathankulist. Number 8, Ashley Tisdale. Ashley was making a big name for herself in the Disney world after starring as Candy Candy girl Maddie on the sitcom Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Her character is considered to be one of the main reasons that that show worked in the first place, so it was surprising to see her suddenly vanish from the acting world in the early 2010s, following the end of the High School Musical trilogy as well as her time with the Sweet Life crew. After leaving Disney briefly to film a few raunchy comedies, including the fifth entry in the Scary Movie franchise, she disappeared and fans were confused. Where's Sharpay? Well, it turns out she decided to focus on her personal life and she tied the knot with musician Christopher French in 2014. After building a solid foundation in her 
her relationship, she shifted her focus to a different style of art in the form of cosmetics. Ashley launched the brand Illuminate Cosmetics, as well as a wellness blog called French, which led to her personal care brand called Being French. While she may have lost her name in the Disney sense, she's rebuilt a solid career for herself in other aspects and is actually set to make a small return to the acting world in a new series for CBS called Brutally Honest, loosely based on Ashley's own life. Well, I'm going to be brutally honest with you, I am watching that show for sure. Number 7, Orlando Brown. That's so Raven. Another series considered to be a part of the golden years, aka the early 2000s of Disney, starred Raven Simone as the titular character who has the ability to briefly see into the future via unprompted visions. I swear, every time I explain a plot to an old Disney show, I just question like, why did I like this? Who pitched this? The show had a stellar supporting cast, including Raven's best friend Chelsea and Eddie, played by Annalise Vanderpool and Orlando Brown. Orlando's time as Eddie was received well with audiences, and he quickly became a fan favorite for not only his comedic abilities, but his dramatic ability as well. After Raven wrapped up its final season, Orlando's career took a bit of a turn. Surprisingly, he was being casted as small side characters or secondary characters with minimum screen time in film and TV. In 2022, he appeared on Dr. Phil's talk show, opened up about his struggles mentally and financially. He also shocked audiences with his new look. He was drenched in tattoos and sporting a pair of demon eye contacts. Unfortunately, it seems that Orlando has fallen victim to the darker side of Disney as he was arrested for a misdemeanor after an altercation with his brother. Ugh. Number 6, Mitchell Musso. Mitch played Hannah Montana's best friend Oliver Oaken on the hit Disney sitcom Hannah Montana. When the show was coming to an end, he began dominating the Disney scene, being casted to voice Jeremy in Phineas and Ferb, playing one of the titular kings in the show Pair of Kings, and he was in something called Hatching Pete, which I vaguely remember watching, but I'm pretty sure it's one of those movies that I have like a repressed memory for. He seemed to be on the same track as Demi Lovato as the next big thing to come from Disney. Uh, people think that about Demi Lovato, right? Unfortunately, his career came to a screeching halt in 2011 when he was arrested in Burbank. Bank, California. He neglected to slow down after being directed by police, and the report said that the moment the window was rolled down, it was like a cloud of no-no juice just drop kicked him in the nostrils. He blew a BLA of 0.8, which for those of you who don't know, means that he was absolutely hammied, bud. He was arrested, forced to participate in a no-no juice educational program, and charged with driving under the influence. Needless to say, that doesn't really go with Disney's vibe. He was recasted on Pair of Kings, his prank show was cancelled, and he was basically blacklisted from Disney entirely. He had also been attempting to start a music career, but that just nosedived into a toilet. If you'd like to find Mitchell these days, just download one of his old songs. You'll be the first one to do it in a while. I'm sure he'll find you. Number 5, Jake Paul. The headline here sounds like a Dr. Seuss title. Jake Paul looted a mall. That's right, the famous YouTuber Jake Paul was briefly a Disney star in the early 2010s, appearing on a short-lived sitcom called Bizarre Varks. In 2020, Paul was involved in a looting that took place in Scottsdale, Arizona. A riot broke out in a mall literally surrounded by police helicopters with lights and sirens, and Jake's reaction? Oh man, we gotta get the cameras, let's go! Video footage was released by Paul himself, showcasing the events of the night. People were smashing windows and taking everything in sight. While Paul posted a statement on Twitter claiming that he had nothing to do with the riots, and they were there exclusively as observers, the video did show Jake interviewing looters in the mall, and of course groups were recognizing him almost immediately. Thankfully, the authorities stepped in to make their move on Jake, who told his fans, no cap, that's tear gas. Bro. Yeah, how is that English? However, that was just the situation Disney needed to finally fire this guy. According to Disney, Jake's reckless public behavior was very well known to them at the time. There had been plans in place to simply address the issue and to learn from it, but following the events in Scottsdale, they had no choice but to just cut ties with the performer immediately. He was charged with criminal trespassing, and while Jake's videos may still rack up millions of views online, he's certainly no celebrity anymore. His defense for the Scottsdale event was that he was documenting it as a quote public service. Well, okay, if I videotape my friend stealing a Star Wars mug from a Hot Topic, is that also a public service? Number four, Jennifer Stone. Another Wizards of Waverly Place co-star, Jennifer Stone is just another one of those people to lose their fame overnight, but it wasn't due to anything outlandish. Jennifer played the best friend to Selena Gomez's Alex Russo, Harper Finkel, on Wizards of Waverly Place. Harper was a bubbly and eccentric character, usually wearing some kind of elaborate dress made from something that just shouldn't be a 
address. She played the role so well that the writers decided to make her and Alex live together in the later seasons to give Stone as much screen time as possible. Following the cancellation of the show, she was swooped up by another channel that I'm apparently not supposed to say the name of, but it rhymes with Clickalodeon, and was casted as the babysitter slash narrator on the show, Dead Time Stories. Good old fashioned horror shows aimed at kids. Huh? Yeah. Are, are you afraid of the dark, anybody? Huh? Unfortunately, that show seemed to be her last, as following the final season, she's remained fairly aloof from the public eye, appearing in small budget flicks, but she mostly stays at home and takes care of her mental and physical health. Jennifer was diagnosed with diabetes in 2017 and has been participating in public outreach programs ever since. You go, Finkel! Number 3, Ricky Ullman. He was Phil. Phil of the future, keeping it together just as best as we can. Sorry, that show had the catchiest theme song of all time. You may recognize Ricky as the face of the hit show, Phil of the future. Following the titular Phil and his family struggling to adjust to the year 2000 after their time machine breaks down in the wrong destination. That's right, if you thought the DeLorean from Back to the Future was strange, these guys built their time machine into an RV. If you're gonna build a time machine, why not do it in style? The show was loved, but it was cut short after only two seasons on air, meaning that Ricky was just 19 when he was suddenly out of steady work. In an interview with Insider Magazine, he said that he regrets the way he handled the situation back then. The reality was Ricky didn't know how to navigate the world of Hollywood as he got the role of Phil because he was pressured into attending an audition. He appeared in a few small projects following the show's cancellation, even making an appearance on the hit comedy series Broad City. But nowadays, Ricky just sits in a chair next to his phone waiting for that call to hopefully come. Reboot time, baby. Number 2, Christy Romano. Christy was Disney's go-to girl in the early 2000s. After breaking onto the scene starring as Ren Stevens in the legendary sitcom The Even Stevens. While she may have starred alongside future Transformers star and maniac Shia LaBeouf, it was Christy that stole the show. She played the character effortlessly for three seasons before being tapped to lend her voice to another Disney icon. Christy provided the voice of the animated super spy Kim Possible. Following the cancellation of that series in 2011, Romano actually used her new fortune to attend film school and study what goes on behind the scenes. Romano has remained outside the acting world since that time, apart from a starring role on Broadway as Belle in Beauty and the Beast in 2018. Her most recent venture is that of a YouTube blogger, now chronicling her day-to-day -day life as a mom. She may not be famous anymore, but she will certainly go down as one of the Disney Channel's greatest. And at number one, Lindsay Lohan. Lindsay is a Disney star who actually never appeared in a sitcom or a TV series. She got her start acting at just the age of three, starring in over 60 TV spots and commercials from brands like Gap, Pizza Hut, and Jell-O, she got her big break when Disney casted her to play two roles in the classic family comedy Parent Trap. She played twin sisters Hallie Parker and Annie James, who randomly meet at a summer camp and discover their parents split them up when they were babies following a divorce. The twins then hatch a plot to get mom and dad back together, and it's really just a delightful movie. Her career only seemed to rise from there, starring in several cult classics like Freaky Friday with Jamie Lee Curtis and Mean Girls as the main character. Katie Heron. Unfortunately, her career took a step in the wrong direction when she was arrested in 2007 for driving under the influence of a controlled substance, for which she served only 84 minutes in jail. Yep, minutes. Some people spend years in jail for less, but Lindsay got a warning. Hmm. Until 2022, her career was at an abrupt standstill, but she not only seems to be better mentally speaking, but she's also under a new contract with the streaming giant Netflix to release a few rom-com flicks over the next couple of years. So maybe her and Adam Sandler will make like a Netflix multi I don't know how I feel about that. Coming at number 10 today, we have the Kardashians. For years, the Kardashian family has often been criticized for being famous for doing nothing. Thanks to Kris Jenner, nobody would probably know their names if she didn't leak a certain tape of her eldest daughter, Kim Kardashian. While her family may now be millionaires and billionaires thanks to their many companies within the clothing and beauty industry, they still try to claim that they work hard to be where they are today. However, if it wasn't for their insane drama and big peaches, we probably wouldn't even know their names. Let's face it, Kris Jenner was smart and she used this to her advantage and with her power she was able to make her family the most famous family in Hollywood. Like everyone knows that if you want to go anywhere at this point, you have to get in with the Kardashian family as once you befriend the whole family, a lot of doors open up and it will help you get to where you need to go. Just look at Black China and Tyga. No one really knew who they were and now they're pretty much household names. However, outside all the drama with this family, what are they actually famous for? So Kendall is a model. But what does the rest of the family do other than complain about the reason that people aren't making it into the industry is because they aren't waking up every day to work their hardest. It seems like today, 
they're only in the spotlight for their toxic image that they impose on weight loss, and how being skinny is the only thing you can do to be pretty. Number nine, Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate is blowing up online due to his controversial opinions on being a man and making money and it's creating headlines across the web. While he's often endorsed a misogynistic culture, he is also admitted to scamming guys on the internet. When he is not creating harmful content on social media, he is frequently seen flaunting his yachts, Bugattis, and wealth. And by now you're probably wishing that this guy never even rose to fame. With Andrew preaching about how women belong to men and men can do anything they want to them shows that Andrew has zero respect for women. And his recent arrest in Romania shows that this guy is garbage. And he's just as garbage as we all believed him to be. Andrew's viewers tend to be misogynistic men like him, as well as naive adolescent boys who just can't get girls to like them. With his content being dangerous to view, these younger individuals have come so heavily influenced by Tate that they have even adopted this misogynistic and racist view that he's expressed on all of his platforms. Examples include how Tate uses racial slurs in his tweets and has degraded women on his podcast for having no innate responsibility or honor. Like, I don't know why the world has a tendency of making such garbage people famous, but out of all the people, why do men love this guy so much? Like, there's nothing impressive. Like, he's even too scared to get into a ring with Logan Paul because he knows he'll lose. While his presence on social media has started to diminish, to diminish, it's clear people like Tate don't deserve fame or money and they're not worth the spotlight at all. Hey my little peaches, are you liking this video so far? If so, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Coming at number eight, we have Chris Brown. At one point, Chris Brown represented the future of pop and RB music. With his Michael Jackson, like dance moves, cute boyish looks, and songs about chasing girls in school, now he's all grown up, tatted, and sings about wetting the bed and making headlines the trending topic on Twitter, and it seems like every week is just a different topic. So why has Chris Brown become a celebrity that everyone loves, but at the same time, loves to hate? Over the years, Chris has had beef with multiple celebrities, and each time there is beef, Chris always seems to be in the wrong as he always takes things way too far. While he was an extremely talented artist, I can only imagine the amount of pressure one must have when living under a microscope. Everything you do or say judged by millions of people. But even with saying that, even being stressed from your job can't justify your actions. And honestly, it just, baffle, it just baffles me why people even choose to support him after he has a long history of being violent with women. So why are we supporting him? Number seven, James Corden. James Corden is only popular for his role as a late night talk show host. But even though everyone knows who he is, he isn't exactly everyone's favorite cup of tea. And a lot of people have actually expressed their dislike towards him. While James has gone on to become one of the most popular talk show hosts in recent years, his popularity hasn't always come with the audience's full approval. While his work in movies such as Into the Woods, Cats, and Trolls could easily make him a beloved figure in the entertainment industry, he has been deemed as being annoying and has earned the dislike of the audience over the years over various reasons. While the reason so many people dislike James Corden has been fueled by different events, both in front of the camera and behind the scenes, it's clear that he shouldn't be famous and none of us should buy into his nice guy image. And on more than one occasion, he's actually been caught being rude and fake in interviews and in his shows when talking to his guests. James is known to interrupt or talk over people and he has the constant need to sing over his guests in his fan favorite segment, Carpool Karaoke. Also, let's not forget how he's rude to servers at restaurants. To me, it seems like James has never worked a customer service job and that's why he has zero respect for people. Number six, Jake and Logan Paul. 
It just seems like everything Jake and Logan Paul do lately is highly controversial and it makes you wonder why the brothers even rose to fame in the beginning. And how they were even able to stay on top despite all the negative things they seem to do. Sure, both brothers are extremely good looking. But do good looks just give you a free pass in the industry to get away with dumb behavior? Both brothers rose to fame after they started out on Vine by sharing prank videos that amassed millions of views. After the video sharing app shut down in 2016, they would take their talents to YouTube and Instagram and they would continue to gain millions of fans. And since their rise to fame, multiple controversies and legal issues have followed them. Despite their controversial lifestyle, the brothers have somehow managed to grow their fame through acting and boxing, making them more than just internet sensations. The Paul brothers' seemingly endless controversies over the years have been polarizing to watch. With Jake facing multiple lawsuits, essay allegations, and have been accused of terrorizing his neighbors, he even lost his gig on the Disney Channel show, Bizarre Bark. Yet it seems like even with scandals and allegations, the brothers have been able to continue on because their fans still remain unfazed by their actions, which is pretty disturbing. Number five, Addison Rae. So something's really been bothering me since the release of TikToker Addison Rae's He's All That Movie. Like, if entering into 2023, we could just not cast TikTok stars in shows and movies, it would be great because it's clear fame doesn't correlate with talent. It seems like TikTokers who become famous often branch out exploring other talents such as those in the music or movie industry. And every time I have to listen to a song or watch the movie, I have to think. Who thought this was a good idea? Now mind you, some have actually been able to cross the platform and make it into other industries such as Bella Porsche, but it seems like for some, they think they can just hide behind their smiles to distract us away from their poor acting. Cough, cough, Addison Ray. Addison's acting, and He's All That was notorious at its best, as the acting was pretty much comparable to the kids on the Disney Channel. If the movie actually starred a trained actress, it probably could have lived up to its hit 1999, Desser, She's All That. Since influencers are already in the position of power and money, opportunities are often just handed to them. And many don't have to work to achieve their goals, which bothers me the most. Those in the acting industry have paid thousands of dollars to attend classes to make names for themselves. That, and that's why influencers on TikTok shouldn't have the ability to become actors instantly without any preparation just because they're famous figures. Number four, Elon Musk. The overwhelming news flow that comes along with Elon Musk and his company just makes all of our heads hurt. And it's actually, to be honest, Pretty weird to watch a bunch of famous people scream at each other over Twitter constantly. While they are always trying to do some righteous combat online, I honestly just want to take out my phone and look at pictures of my cat while it all unfolds. Now, there are essentially two distinct narratives when it comes to Elon. And they are, in their simplest terms, one, Elon is a hero, and two, Elon is a villain. But if I had a third option, Honestly, it would be who cares and why are we even talking about this guy as he's just a normal guy with an unusual amount of money. To support any of his moves, you practically choose to emphasize certain facts and de-empathize others and you literally accuse everyone that writes about Musk in a big picture way of cherry picking. While his narrative has definitely been divided between genius and villain, it becomes so large that trying to just get back up to speed on all of his drama just makes me not want to come into work and read about it. Like I get it, the dude is filthy rich and he's highly controversial as he tries to make the world a dangerous place while implementing free speech. But do we have to make all rich people famous because Elon is just someone I would like to forget about at this point. Number three, the royal family. While the queen was pretty popular, there have been a series of public relation disasters that have tarnished the rest of the royal family. And while Charles has taken over the throne, it makes us wonder if the UK will soon abolish the monarchy. Now, the institution itself continues to enjoy broad support and with the UK under unprecedented strain from the Scottish separatism, proves that it may be hard for any future monarch to be able to provide the same steady influence as Queen Elizabeth did. While many controversies never touch the Queen, it's bound to make things even more difficult for Charles, who has been subjected to intense scrutiny. 
especially since people still believe that the royal family had something to do with the passing of Princess Diana. The whole family is just a giant symbol of what's wrong with the world and it makes me question why do we even still have a monarchy at this point? Like what are they truly doing that the world leaders aren't currently doing? Like let's be real here, Charles is going to have to find someone to help him fill in Elizabeth's shoes as it's definitely going to take two men to do her job. As we're not just questioning the monarchy at this point, but the country that produced it. Like we're honestly not in the medieval times anymore, and we need to step away from the whole one family rules the world type of thing. Number two, James Charles. There's something about James Charles still being famous after trying to talk to younger boys that just doesn't sit right with me. Or can we also bring up the fact that he hangs out with younger kids that became famous on TikTok? Something about that just gives me the ick. At this point, it only seems like he's famous because he's influenced by fame, power, and a fat bank account. But his actions just prove that he's a bad role model and there's something that's just really sus about him. Even while he has become one of the most hated influencers around the controversial situations he's found himself in, seems like fans still believe he wasn't completely in the wrong for any of them. A majority of people just didn't care to follow the drama surrounding the beauty community because they found it just cringy. Like he's clearly a terrible person, there's no denying that, but at this point, He's just famous for being famous and, it, and it's kind of really hard to see why he's still on the top when he's not even talented nor charismatic. Number one, Dr. Phil. Okay, I honestly hate cancel culture, but if there's one person that needs to be canceled, it's Dr. Phil. How this man still has a show is beyond me. Dr. Phil has pretty much become a controversial figure since he became one of the highest paid celebrities in Hollywood. With him having some flamboyant cases of people with problems, he has somehow managed to build an audience who will boo and make fun of his guests rather than call him out on his outrageous behavior. While he claims to give some free treatment, there have been claims of abuse at a ranch type facility treatment that he sends minors to. A young woman claims that she was not even allowed to call home and even bad baby has confirmed that she witnessed some heartbreaking things go down on the ranch and called Dr. Phil out on it. What's even more concerning is that Dr. Phil doesn't even have a license to practice any of this in any state, although he does have the proper education, credentials. He has often stated that he doesn't like one-on-one -on -one therapy, but He'll do it just to humiliate you in front of an audience? There's something about messing with someone's mental health publicly, let alone behind closed doors that bothers me, and it's kind of outrageous that people think it's okay when he does it.